Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call uh, the uh, June meeting of the University of Michigan Board of Regents uh, to order. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, wearing your masks today to protect uh, health and safety uh, while we continue to operate the university. Uh, obviously, the masks are symbolic right now because most everybody is in their homes by themselves. Uh, but I wanted to highlight the importance and the sense of a uh, personal responsibility in helping the university uh, and our state uh, confront the COVID-19 pandemic. We're all remote today, so I'll call the roll of the regions one by one so they can be noted for the record for those not able to see on the screen. Uh, when I call your name, please indicate if you're present. Regent Acker. Good morning. Regent Beam. Regent Beam. Struggling with my mute button, but present. Good morning. Regent Bernstein. I'm present. Thank you. Regent Brown. Present. Regent Diggs. Morning. Present. Good morning. Regent Illich. I'm present. Thank you. Regent Weiser. Uh, Regent Weiser is in the process of attempting to call in and we'll have him shortly. Uh, Regent White, I believe Regent White is on assignment and she may not be able to join us today. Uh, also joining today are all of the university's executive officers. Uh, as members of a public research university community, we share a responsibility that's been painfully and courageously brought to life uh, of our forefront of our national conscious in recent, in recent weeks. Uh, we must use our power to address the systemic racism. Black lives matter. George Floyd and far too many black Americans have been killed by police who have forsaken their oath to protect and serve or by vigilantes who escaped the consequences of their horrendous actions. These tragedies are crimes and an appalling consequence of systemic racism. I applaud all those who are demonstrating against injustice and working to create a better world. This especially includes the members of our community past and present and the many units of the University of Michigan that have stepped forward to confront a society and institutions that have devalued, dehumanized, and perpetuated violence against African Americans for centuries. This activism inspires us as we continue our efforts to break down barriers to access through programs such as Wolverine Pathways and the Go Blue Guarantee. We've worked to make our campus more welcoming through actions in recent years, such as building a new Trotter Multicultural Center in the heart of the campus and removing the CC Little name from a building on our campus. We are looking at other actions that we can take in the coming months to live out our values. We all have a responsibility to advance justice, equality, peace, and understanding, to challenge and ultimately end the evil of racism and to ensure that our university lives up to uh, the aspirations to make our world better for all. I ask us now to observe a moment of silence in honor and remembrance of the victims of hatred and racism in our nation. Thank you. Earlier this week, we announced that the University of Michigan plans to offer a public health informed in residence semester this fall. For Ann Arbor, the semester will consist of a mixture of in-person and remote classes structured to reflect our commitment to promoting public health while fulfilling our fundamental mission of transformative undergraduate, graduate, and professional education. U of M Dearborn and U of M Flint announced their fall plans as well, with elements developed by members of their communities to be tailored to each campus's individual needs. The thoughtful and deliberate efforts of hundreds of members of the U of M community have given me confidence that we can do this safely while upholding the excellence of a Michigan <laughs> education. We will continue to plan and prepare in the months ahead. 
We have personnel news regarding two of the many U of M experts who helped craft our plan for the fall. This is Simon Himboldt Taylor's final board meeting as interim vice president for student life, as Martino Harmon will join us on July 1st. Dr. Taylor has led student life with the utmost distinction and has helped us ensure a smooth leadership transition during one of the most challenging periods in the history of our university. Over the past several months, she's demonstrated enormous care for our students, centering their needs despite the rapidly changing conditions of the pandemic. In addition to implementing important health and safety measures since the beginning of the outbreak, she and her team enriched our students' remote educational experience by helping them connect with one another and engaging them in innovative efforts in leadership development, career skills, and the planning process for the fall. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. I'm also pleased to recommend the reappointment of Preeti Milani as U of M's Chief Health Officer. In this role, Dr. Milani advises the executive team and me on the health and wellness of our community, including disease management, public health preparedness, and the promotion of healthy practices. She's a leading scholar and practitioner, recently emerging as a trusted voice nationally on campus health and safety during the COVID-19 pandemic. Her collaborations across many units have enabled us to plan and implement our gradual process of resuming activities at U of M. Thank you, Dr. Milani. The June meeting is traditionally the time that the regions vote on a new chair and vice chair of the board for the coming year. The election will take place later this meeting, but I would like to now thank uh, board chair, Regent Ron Weiser and board vice chair, Regent Denise Illich for their dedicated work over the last many months. It's truly been a pleasure working so closely with the two of you. The University of Michigan continues to strive to ensure that all members of our community will be able to pursue their ambitions on our campuses. This value is a fundamental component of our excellence and mission as a public research university. Two rulings last week by the United States Supreme Court are victories for equity and inclusion in our nation. The court rejected attempts to dismantle the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program or DACA which protects undocumented immigrants brought to this country as children. U of M will continue to advocate for a permanent solution that will provide a pathway to citizenship for the estimated 650,000 dreamers who enhance our nation's communities. Last Monday, the court ruled that gay, lesbian, and transgender employees are included in the protection from discrimination based on sex by the 1964 Civil Rights Act. While U of M's existing non-discrimination policy already prohibited discrimination based on sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, it's wonderful to see protections extended by federal law. Unfortunately, this week's executive order that further restricts the immigration of talented students, scholars, and highly skilled workers is gravely concerning. Such patterns of exclusion are antithetical to our view that we are strengthened as a university, a nation, and an economy when top minds from all parts of the world choose to work and study with us. I thank U of M's many students, faculty, staff, and supporters who continue to advocate for and advance the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion on our campus and across the nation. Earlier this week, we announced that the Commission on Presidential Debates had granted U of M's request to be released from its agreement to host a presidential debate on October 15th. It was a disappointing but necessary step as we continue to grapple with the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. This was the right decision for the university, given the scale and complexity of the work we're undertaking to help assure a safe and healthy fall semester for our campus and the city of Ann Arbor. We will move forward with the robust programming being planned around the debate, including our democracy and debate theme semester, virtual watch parties on campus, and participation in the Big Ten voting challenge. 
we must remain true to the ideas that motivated us in our desire to host the debate. There's no shortage of societal problems that demand the attention of an engaged academic community. I hope we can use the time running up to the election to have substantive discussions on issues such as immigration, equitable economic prosperity, healthcare, education, and systemic racism. On the agenda this month are the annual budget presentations for the university. All of the deans, executive officers, and their teams have focused on strategic investments that enhance our priorities of academic excellence, affordability, and societal impact. I especially appreciate the work and leadership of Interim Provost Collins and Senior Vice Provost for Academic and Budgetary Affairs, Amy Dittmar. Our Ann Arbor budget continues its focus on academic excellence and affordability amidst the challenging circumstances from the COVID-19 pandemic. The budget proposes investments in health and safety, instructional technology, and a 5.6% increase in undergraduate financial aid. We've implemented new cost containment efforts as we anticipate decreases in state funding and out of state and international student enrollment. To balance the budget, provide higher levels of financial aid and adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic, we're proposing a 1.9% increase for in-state and out-of-state tuition on the Ann Arbor campus. The $12.8 million increase in financial aid will mean that most in-state undergraduates receiving need-based aid will see no increase in tuition costs for the coming year. This budget also includes continuing the Go Blue Guarantee. We'll be hearing additional details shortly, including presentations for Michigan Medicine, athletics, housing, and our regional campuses. Finally, I've arranged with Chancellor Dutta and Chancellor Grasso to make a $10 million fund available to be shared by the UM Clinton Dearborn campuses. These funds will be devoted to critical new student success initiatives identified by the respective chancellor and specific to each campus's strategic priorities. This is only part of our ongoing commitment to our regional campuses to help them best serve their students and the state. I look forward to working with the new board committee to ensure the continued success and excellence of U of M Dearborn and U of M Flint. I'd like to note that I believe Regent Weiser has now joined uh, the meeting. Uh, I'll now uh, turn things over to Vice President Churchill uh, to provide for several pub public comments on the agenda. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yes, we had three peop people signed up to speak on an agenda item, but there may only be two, but I'll go through the names. One, I think, canceled. Um, I'd like to remind the speakers now and at the end of the meeting that you each have up to three minutes to speak. You will be unmuted um, by our wonderful IT team um, to speak. And then when you're done, um, you'll be going off. So, um, and I also want to remind folks that have not uh, spoken to the board before that often topics require study and analysis. So the presidents and the president and the regents will not necessarily respond to comments at today's meeting, but they certainly are heard and considered. Okay, so I will start with our first speaker, uh, Thomas Chung, who I believe has canceled. Mr. Chung. Oh, hi. Hello. Oh, you are here. Um, yep, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. So I actually originally um, was going to cancel because. I kind of realized that you guys had already made your decision on um, tuition, but um, I could go ahead and give my spiel because this more pertains to the Flint campus, and I'm sure Chancellor Dutt is here and listening as well. Um, so hello, first of all, my name is Thomas Chung. I'm a graduate student at the University of Michigan Flint. Um, of course, I wanted to thank everyone for giving me this opportunity to speak on the matter. So it was first kind of brought to my attention by a fellow classmate of mine who told me that we really need to be aware of a potential tuition increase due to the current recession that we we're going through. And I was kind of sitting there thinking to myself, how does that make any sense to increase tuition during a recession where even though we're students, we're still going through a recession as well. Uh, I really couldn't figure it out, did a bunch of research on the internet and still didn't get where the correlation of a recession and tuition increases come from. Um, I had the opportunity to serve as the advocacy chair and the doctor of physical therapy student association for the university 
And I wanted to assure my fellow classmates that we could do something in order to guarantee our tuition rates stay the same. So we started a petition just a little over two weeks ago and gathered over 500 signatures to enact a tuition freeze at the University of Michigan and its subsidiaries um, with schools across the state already giving their students release by, relief by announcing a tuition freeze uh, for the next school year. Just to name a few, Central Michigan, Oakland University, Western Michigan, and my undergraduate modern Michigan State University. So uh, we're definitely kind of saddened that um, you know, the university has taken until now to make a stance on this. Um, I had emailed with Chancellor Dutta before uh, about tuition rates, and he told me that our tuition rates could be targeted to address the significant decline in enrollment for the Flint campus specifically over the past few years. But it's honestly really clear to me, and I hope that it makes sense to the board um, and everyone else listening, that increasing tuition is not going to make coming to the Flint campus more appealing and we may actually see an even more decline in enrollment should there be a tuition increase. And I'm sure that you guys have already thought about that heavily. Uh, I'm, co I'm quite aware of the financial hit that the university and the health system has taken, but honestly, we as students shouldn't have to bear the burden of this recession as we're dealing with financial burdens as well. Um, we're simply asking for tuition freeze, um, I guess for the Flint campus specifically, while there are other students of other universities that are riding for uh, lowering intuition, but even I can understand that it really isn't feasible. However, it should be noted that we're still paying for certain facilities that are unusable to us currently, like gyms, classrooms, and clinical resources, et cetera. Um, increasing tuition on top of not being able to use these services feels like a slap in the face to the students. Um, I know that there's been a lot of thought put into this decision already, but we're really urging you uh, to not increase tuition. So prospective and current students uh, see this and hopefully they appreciate the gesture uh, by continuing to enroll as well as continu continuing to represent what a Wolverine truly embodies. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chung. <clears throat> I'd now call on our next speaker, Damian uh, Cheshire. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Damien Chisare. I'm a rising senior in the Ford School of Public Policy. I'm speaking to you this morning on behalf of the Central Student Government Assembly, of which I'm a member as a representative from the Ford School. <laughs> I'm understanding today that you are deciding tuition rates for next year, a, tw a year that will surely be challenging and significantly different than usual while well, the university finds itself with unexpected financial difficulties due to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. To contribute to this discussion, members of the CSG Assembly wrote, executed, and analyzed a survey sent to the entire UM student body to better understand their enrollment preferences for fall 2020, given the different instruction formats and possible tuition rates. We believe that student input is vitally important to this discussion and have submitted this report to contribute to you making this decision. In this survey's report, and its one-page summary, which has been provided to this board and which can be found at csg.umich.edu, you will find analysis of the responses of 2,860 students, a response rate of 35.75% out of a sample of 8,000 students. The majority of students in their responses indicated that they, expect, that they expected a hybrid instruction format but would also expect a tuition decrease of 20% or less. Students would also expect a significant decrease or discount in unions and rec sports fees, health services, infrastructure and maintenance, and any applicable course fees and the international student fee. We understand that this is a very difficult decision for the members of this board as I'm sure that they are well aware of the different financial difficulties that not only are affecting students, but their families as well. We, can, we would just like to contribute to, the, to this discussion respectfully and that we can have for us to ensure the, the best learning that we can, the best learning year next year, sorry. Um, it seems like it was only a couple days ago where I was in Costa Rica with Provost Collins and Although this year, although we had a lot of great things going on this year, unfortunately, 
we understand that next year may be very different. We thank you for your we thank you for your time and for your and for all the work and the service that you provide to these students and to our university. But we would just like to respectfully submit student input to your decisions for the coming year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Damian. Uh, nice touch there. Um, okay, our next speaker is Mariana Smith. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Loud and clear. Thanks. Thank you. Well, my name is Mariana Smith, and I'm a second year Master of Public Policy student at the Ford School. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I'd like to echo the points of my fellow Fordy Damian. I understand that the financial strain of COVID-19 has impacted individuals, organizations, and institutions across the world. I know that you've heard many student requests for tuition reduction, and I understand the difficult situation you are in, ensuring the financial health of the university. With that said, I hope to provide you greater understanding of why students have come to that conclusion. On a normal day in January 2020, on my walk from the law school cafe to the Ford School, I would pass flyers advertising events with students I'd yet to meet and scholars I was excited to see come to campus. I'd go to my first class filled with robust conversations and debates where I could see the facial expressions of my classmates and read the room. I'd spend my downtime in the computer lab or reading room sharing a table with my friends. In my second class of the day, we'd have small group discussions that seamlessly returned to the full class. I'd spend the remainder of my day on campus at the IMSB working out. And on extra special days, I'd get to shake the hands of people like Ambassador Susan Rice and talk to her about my future in the Foreign Service. In the spring of 2020, the only events I attended were sent to me by the Ford School, limiting me from meeting other students and reaching across disciplines. My classes were clunky, distracted, and unfulfilling. Professors had difficulty navigating the online platform, often letting conversations derail or leaving the meetings entirely because they lacked technical savvy. My fellow 40s and I couldn't collaborate like we always had. I was paying for a gym, library space, and computers I couldn't use, and I was attending online events with notable speakers that felt no different than watching the news. The once-in-a-lifetime connections of in-person events were lost. So as you can sense, students are frustrated and worried about the upcoming academic year. Many of us are not confident that we will make it through the new academic schedule without having to go remote because of a spike in COVID-19 cases. We are afraid that this semester will be an extension of the inadequate educational experience of last semester, and you can't guarantee us any different. This is a diversity, equity, and inclusion issue. There will be health issues that prevent students from returning to campus. There also will be immigration challenges for many members of our community that make it a more enriching place to learn. How can we expect students to pay the same amount for a subpar education for factors outside of their control? What will you do when the public health crisis forces us to return to 100% remote classes? How can you justify full price for a service you're not delivering on? As you've noticed, in addition to our unwillingness to pay for an inadequate education, we are also requesting a reduction or erasure of all fees that we will not have the luxury of benefiting from this academic year. We are willing to continue this conversation and to help the university get through this hard time, and we're hoping that the university can extend us the same courtesy. I appreciate your time. Thank you. That is our last um, public speaker, uh, President Schlissel, at this time. Uh, thank you very much, Vice President Churchill. We're now going to move to the supplemental agenda. Um, um, budget presentations are listed on the supplemental agenda, broken down by campus. Uh, following the presentations, I'll open the floor for discussion and, and of course, a vote. Uh, we'll begin with Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer Hegarty with the overall revenue and expender opera, uh, expenditure operating budgets. Uh, Vice President Hegarty. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I'm pleased to provide to the board the consolidated summary of the operating budget revenues and expenditures for fiscal 2021. The consolidation reflects all operating units of the Ann Arbor, Dearborn, and Flint campuses. This includes, but is not limited to, limited to all academic health student life and athletic units. This presentation is summarized by funding source. When a budget is approved, the line item details of the budget will be published and made available to the public. As you mentioned, several of our colleagues will be commenting on the specific, on specific components of the consolidated budget 
after which the board will be asked to vote on the consolidated budget. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll first consider the uh, Ann Arbor campus and then um, uh, allow for questions, of course. Uh, we begin with interim Provost uh, Collins and the Ann Arbor General Fund operating budget. Thank you very much, President Schlissel, and good morning, everybody. Um, while I uh, wait for the, the slides um, to come up, uh, I wanted to say, but excellent, thank you very much, um, that I am pleased to present the fiscal year 2021 general fund budget for the Ann Arbor campus. Uh, slide two, please. Budget planning for fiscal year 21 has been challenging and unique. The COVID pandemic imposes new costs and revenue pressures, giving this budget a distinctive level of uncertainty. Despite these unique circumstances, this budget provides the resources necessary to continue the academic excellence of this world-class institution while protecting health and safety and maintaining accessibility and affordability for students. We will use resources thoughtfully and strategically to protect and enhance the quality of education and experience that we deliver to our students. Next slide, please. The pandemic brought about an abrupt change to university operations in March of this year and necessitated new strategic planning for a return to our mission critical activities in research, teaching and service. Across campus members of the University of Michigan community have invested significant time and effort in planning how to safely and effectively meet the challenges of the 2021 fiscal year. We are putting research into practice to protect our students, faculty, and staff. Our plans are informed by the guidance and expertise of U of M experts from public health, education, medicine, and other areas across our campus community. Courses will be offered in a range of instruction modes, some in person, some remote, and some hybrid, with students on the Ann Arbor campus able to benefit from that mixture. They'll also provide a robust set of fully rem remote courses for students who choose or need to be remote, recognizing that some instructors will need to teach remotely as well. Co-curricular, community building, and other student engagement opportunities are being adapted to serve students during this challenging time. This budget aligns university resources with these plans, and I want to thank the many faculty, staff, and students who contributed to this planning. I would also like to express my appreciation to all who will help us to carry these plans forward. Our combined efforts will enable us to offer meaningful experiences for all of our students while caring for the health and safety needs of our community as well. Next slide, please. We are committed to student success and to providing all of our students with access to an education that is delivered in an equitable and inclusive manner. To that end, we provide a broad array of academic and other support services. A few examples include mentoring, career services, writing support, and science learning support. This budget includes resources to continue these services, helping to ensure that students persist in their studies and graduate on time. Next slide, please. The pandemic provides an opportunity to highlight the critical role of public research universities. U of M is the largest public research university in the nation and home to a top academic health center, making this university especially well equipped to deliver solutions to the most daunting COVID challenges. Researchers across a wide array of disciplines are using their expertise to address the global COVID-19 pandemic. And this research is vital to the health of our state, country, and the world, and to our ability to recover and rebuild after this crisis. Next slide, please. COVID-19 has created significant financial challenges for the university through revenue reductions and cost increases that are extremely uncertain. In particular, we cannot predict the nature and duration of the pandemic, constraints on travel and visas, or the economic downturn. And these are all significant factors that put our enrollment and state support at risk. The magnitude of additional costs for a public health informed academic year are uncertain as well. Next slide, please. Cost containment is a critical part of our response in the current challenges, to the current challenges. 
The fiscal year 21 budget reflects a series of new efforts to constrain costs that go well beyond the ongoing cost containment measures that the university has adopted annually. Our approach affirms that people are the university's most significant asset. However, we recognize that these efforts require shared sacrifice among faculty and staff and deferral of many plans for new programs and for capital improvements. We are monitoring closely and recognize that additional reductions will be necessary if state funding is reduced, enrollment targets are not met, or new costs are higher than anticipated. Next slide, please. The $2.3 billion general fund budget detailed in our action item is based on a state appropriation of $325 million, an incremental $102 million in cost containment and reallocation, and a recommended tuition increase of 1.9%. This small tuition increase provides an expansion of financial aid to support Michigan families, and it also offsets new health and safety costs associated with a public health-informed academic year. The dollar amounts shown represent the increase for the most common lower division undergraduate rates and general Rackham graduate rates. A limited, num a limited number of differential increases are also recommended for specific graduate programs. Next slide, please. The University of Michigan remains committed to making a U of M education accessible for all Michigan families, regardless of financial means. The FY21 budget recommendation includes a 5.6% increase in the undergraduate aid budget to ensure that we can continue our aid commitments for all who qualify for need-based aid. We demonstrate our commitment to Michigan families in several ways. We continue our Go Blue guarantee and offer a free tuition for in-state families earning up to $65,000. We propose an increase in need-based grant aid to cover the proposed increase in tuition. This equates to a 0% change in net tuition for most in-state students who receive need-based grant aid. And we propose a modest increase in tuition rates, 1.9% or $290 per year for most common in-state rates. Next slide, please. This slide provides a summary of the general fund budget for the Ann Arbor campus with the key revenue flows and their allocation. These numbers are also available in your materials and I will not go through them in detail here. Next slide, please. This budget reflects the hard work and dedication of faculty and staff across the university at all levels who have put forth extraordinary effort to ensure that the University of Michigan can carry out its mission under new constraints imposed by a global pandemic. Importantly, the budget supports a public health informed academic year, enabling in-person engagements for our students as well as needed financial aid support for Michigan families in this extremely challenging time. With our combined stewardship, the University of Michigan can continue to deliver a quality educational experience and pursue the groundbreaking research and discovery upon which the state, nation, and world depend. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Provost Collins. Uh, I'd like to next call upon Vice President Taylor uh, to discuss other aspects of the Ann Arbor budget proposal, and then we'll take some questions or comments. Uh, Vice President Taylor. Yes, thank you, President Schlissel, and uh, good morning to the Board of Regents and all. Um, I'd like to begin with housing and dining, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present the recommendation for a room and board rate increase of 1.9%. This increase will allow Michigan Housing and Dining to absorb the mandatory contractual cost increases and invest in a public health informed environment for our residents. A safe environment includes changes in housing and dining operations, such as extending dining hours to enable social distancing, boxed meals, and increased level of sanitation in our bathrooms, showers, and public spaces. Our written report presents the rates of the various styles of housing for our undergraduate and graduate students. Our commitment is to provide affordable housing to our students and provide them with a robust co-curricular learning experience in a safe and healthy environment. Thank you for your consideration of our housing and dining rate. 
I'd now like to present to you the request for our fee increase for University Health Service. As you are aware, UHS is a primary care center for our U of M students, addressing the holistic health, including physical, psychological, physical therapy, as well as other wellness needs of our students. This year, we are recommending a 1.9 base increase to provide resources to augment much needed mental health support. Mental health is a heightened need and this base increase will be utilized to hire additional counselors and to enhance access for our students. We appreciate your consideration. Next, I wish to present our request for a COVID fee. With the prevalence of COVID-19 in our society, our goal is to provide the safest campus we can for our students. Student Life is seeking a COVID dedicated fee of $50 per student per term. This one-time fee will be utilized to provide various preventative and responsive interventions during the pandemic. This includes starter kits for our students with masks, strip thermometers, and sanit sanitizers for each student, uh, quarantine and isolation spaces for impacted students, vaccines, testing, contact tracing, and other such measures to address the needs of our students during this pandemic. Thank you for your consideration of this dedicated COVID fee. Finally, I wish to discuss the fee assessment for central student government, student legal services, and school and college governments. As you know, the current fees per student and per term for student central government is $9.19, student legal services $8.50 and school college government is $1.50. We are not recommending any changes to these fees this year. In closing, each June, Student Life submits a report on the financial activities of central student government. On behalf of CSG, today I am providing you with the comparative financial report for the calendar years 2018 and 2019. This report is prepared by Student Life staff and affirmed by the leadership of Central Student Government. This concludes my comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Vice President Taylor. Uh, I'd open the floor in the event that there are questions or comments on the Ann Arbor budget, and I'll point out that there'll be another opportunity before we take a vote on the consolidated budget for discussions and questions as well. Uh, are there any questions or comments on the Ann Arbor budgets? I have uh, comments I want to make. Thanks, Regent Illich. The floor is yours. In the last 120 days, we have seen unprecedented changes, challenges, and volatility because of COVID-19. We are experiencing a global pandemic in which the entire world went into shelter in place and businesses were forced to temporarily close. Unemployment in the U.S. went from approximately 3% to over 20% in a matter of weeks. The price of oil fell below zero. Many well-known U.S. businesses are on the verge of bankruptcy or declared bankruptcy. And small business owners are experiencing the same. There is not enough testing, little tracing, and no vaccine. We have not yet felt the full effects and consequences of COVID-19. For at least the last 40 years, the Board of Regents have voted to increase tuition because of the university has tremendous pricing power. That is the value of a U of M degree is so high and the demand for admission is so strong that any increase is possible, notwithstanding the state's intervention to cap tuition increases. That paradigm has shifted this year and it's incumbent on us to acknowledge that shift. The value proposition isn't the same this year. This is nobody's fault and the university will do the best it can to make a meaningful year for students, but it's just not the same. In the spring, the entire educational experience was remote at full price. In the summer, the entire educational experience was remote at full price. The fall, if we are even able to complete the semester in Ann Arbor, will be a semester with a very high percentage of the educational experience being remote and many experiences and services compromised. Given these inescapable facts, a tuition cut would actually be in order, but in any event, 
raising tuition 1.9% is simply tone deaf, particularly when there is a diminution in value. In terms of value, this is a situation that is not unique to U of M, but nationally due to the challenges of COVID and the pandemic environment. Class action lawsuits have been filed across the country by students who want refunds. As relayed in an article written by Greta Anderson of Inside Higher Education, she relays, this is a national problem where colleges and universities with endowments in the hundreds of millions and even billions of dollars are passing the entire burden of the pandemic onto students and their families. This is not fair, it is not right, close quote. This proposed increase in tuition is inconsistent with the pandemic mantra of, we are all in this together. Raising prices when we have high unemployment, viable businesses being on the verge of bankruptcy, most people in the private sector taking 20 to 30% decreases in compensation, a 12% decrease in the value of equities, just to name a few, is just plain wrong. Moreover, the sacrifices made routinely by our students and their families is not commensurate with the sacrifices made by the university. Students and their families are being asked to sacrifice more. Dr. Fauci reports, we are still in the first wave of this pandemic. Medical experts state there is a strong likelihood we will experience a second wave. As such, it is within the possibility, and some say probability, we will not be able to complete the fall semester. With this uncertainty, why would we increase the cost of tuition to our students and their families? And why would we increase the student's health service fee during a pandemic? The University of Michigan is a wealthy institution and can well afford to maintain the status quo in tuition costs during this pandemic. As our chief financial officer indicated in her annual report, and I quote, the university's financial position remains very strong, close quote. We have many financial levers we can pull to maintain our current tuition cost. Just to name a few, we have over a $12 billion endowment and our spending policy can be changed to adapt to our new normal. We have a $1 billion letter of credit we have multiple reserves to tap into, and we have many, many opportunities to control costs and spend money more efficiently. And again, as reported by our chief financial officer, and I quote, a revenue diversification strategy has been in place at U of M for years, enabling the institution to be financially stable through various economic cycles and avoid unnecessary dependence on student tuition and fee increases. In addition, maintaining our current tuition rate and the status quo will not compromise our ability to provide financial aid. And further, U of M is becoming more and more dependent and accessible to the wealthy, particularly from out of state. Our student minority admissions remain low with little if any growth. The continuing of increasing tuition costs does not help this matter particularly now. We cannot fail our students and their families at this most critical and dire moment. And it's for these reasons that I feel at this time I should oppose the proposed 1.9% increase in tuition for the Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor budget during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Illich. Uh, other comments at this point before we move on to the uh, subsequent budgets, and uh, once again, there will be a chance again at the end. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we next hear from Chancellor Dutta on the Flint campus budgets. Chancellor? Well, thank you, President Slushel, and good morning, everyone. Let me, <coughs> excuse me, um, let me first begin uh, by thanking President Slishel for the significant investment that you spoke about at the beginning of this meeting. This, these funds would be very, very important to both Flint and Dearborn, and for us will be devoted to student success initiatives in support, our, in support of our strategic priorities. And the strategic priorities for Flint is very simple. 
enrollment, retention, and graduation. So thank you, President Slesho. We at U of M Flint are taking decisive steps to secure our institution's future, as well as keep the net cost of students attending U of M Flint amongst the lowest in the state. Uh, as the budget materials indicate, um, the general fund request assumes a flat state funding and a 3.9% increase combined tuition and fees for both undergraduate and graduate. Let me explain that. It's a $243 per term increase for an in-state undergraduate student. We understand that because of the COVID-19, all of us, including U of M Flint, has rolled out our semester plan, which pretty much says that 75% of our courses will be online, will be remote. In keeping with that, we are eliminating the $46 per credit for online courses. This has been there forever, but we keep that, we keep in mind that in the pandemic, we need to do everything we can. So we are eliminating that. We are also not charging a COVID fee. It is embedded in the, in the tuition increase. So for a student taking 15 hours, would have a total savings because of the elimination of the online fee of $690, more than offsetting the 243 per term increase. So um, it is difficult, but we are doing our best. The average increase that we are proposing for room and board is approximately 2.3 average, and the board is 0.09. Room rates, as you know, will vary room by room type. So let me end here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there uh, questions or comments on the Flint budget before we move on? Yeah, it's, this is uh, this is Mark. Um, before I get going, Sally, we're both in the law library. I just don't I don't see you here right now. <laughs> um, uh, I saw the you down there at the other end. <laughs> most time I've spent in the law library in my <laughs> life, actually. Um, sorry for those of you who've heard that joke before. Um, so Deva, um, with res I think this board, uh, uh, it's an, an understatement to say we are deeply interested in knowing how best to address enrollment retention and completion challenges at Flint and in Dearborn. Uh, I know the president just announced um, what I think is a, an important good important start to address those issues and support from the camp from, from the Ann Arbor um, Ann Arbor budget for lack of a better word. Um, but I know colleagues are very eager to understand with some degree of specificity what those efforts may look like um, from someone who is um, uh, at the university in Flint and confronting those issues on a daily basis. Can you it's a very important topic to me as well. Can you address that? And also, uh, Dominic, when, you, when we get to you, if you could address that as well. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Regent Bernstein. That is a very important uh, project that my leadership team and I will engage in now that we know the investment, the significant investment from Ann Arbor. But the kind of areas that we will be looking at include um, increasing the number of advisors, which we know has been documented, impact very positively uh, to keep, to increase the retention rates. So we are going to do that. Um, we are going to look at ways by which students at the, at the end of their program, so within like 30 credits or so, uh, if we can um, help them, those that need some financial help to stay in the program. So that will help graduation rates. And we will also be thinking about how best we can provide 
academic support. There are several students who, because of financial difficulties, uh, it translates to academic, uh, lack of academic performance. So, so we'll be looking at that as well. And finally, um, I would say that we have in this budget um, for next year, $11 million approximately for institutional aid. That is a significant amount that we will continue to use to assist students uh, that need the financial support. So all of this, Regent Bernstein, uh, are initial thoughts, but as we uh, go back to campus, um, or as in like beginning tomorrow, we will develop more plans and share it with, with the president as well as the Board of Regents. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Dutta. Uh, additional, oh, Mark, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Mark. So, so the, 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 you mentioned $11 million with, uh, for institutional aid. Is that uh, in, in addition to money that uh, President Schlissel referred to earlier? Is that in addition to the $10 million or the approximate $10 million? Yes, it is in addition to. We are. So you're looking at potentially north of $20 million. Uh, well, for U of M Flint, the institutional aid for next year is in right. the neighborhood of $11 million. And okay. based on what uh, the president has committed, Right. Yeah. So we'll add to that. Sure. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Dada? Yes. So it's, it's my understanding that about 48% of the students at Flint are Pell eligible. How many, I know the majority of students receive, receive some type of financial aid. What is the percentage? Do you know? Um, a significant percentage of our students get get financial aid. Um, I'd be hard pressed to give you a number and then be proven wrong. I would, I would rather get back to you with, with an accurate number if that is okay with you, but it is more than 50% for sure. Thank you. Other questions or comments for Chancellor Dutta? Uh, Mark, it's Mike Beam. Yeah, Ch Mike. Um, Chancellor Dutta, just, so people understand when you talk about the $11 million that you have uh, at U of M Flint uh, this year toward financial aid, um, I think that I think it's a, just over 40% of students are Pell eligible at U of M Flint. But if I'm an incoming Pell eligible student this year, can you ballpark what it would cost me in tuition to attend school? Sure. So, so, um, so all of these are approximate numbers and I'm doing online arithmetic here. So our, um, with the tuition increase that is proposed, if the board were to approve it, um, a student would pay about 6,400 in tuition fees per semester. So let's make that 13,000 rounding up for the year. Uh, 13,000 rounding up for the year, our average institutional aid uh, is close to 1,600, I would say. So you subtract that from 13,000, um, that makes it 11,400. Then you apply the Pell, so that's a, little over um, 6,000. And then if there are any other loan that the institution, uh, the student takes, it will be, it'll be reduced by that amount. Now, I did use the average institutional aid. So for specific students, it could be much more. So does that get to the question that you were asking, Regent Beam? Yeah, I think so. I was just, um, because we had talked, you know, about different scenarios for Pell eligible students. And I think Pell 
last year was 6,345. Mm -hmm. So that would, you know, <clears throat> come off. And then, uh, you know, and I was just wondering what the, uh, you know, what the number is if I was a Pell eligible student as to what I would be, uh, you know, paying in tuition, uh, you know, that would be, uh, you know, passed on to me to pay. Yeah, so it's, it's roughly in that range. But again, we are all talking averages in terms of institutional aid and what the individual actually receives in Pell and, and other loans. But, but the number would be in the range I described. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Beam. Other uh, questions or comments? Uh, thank you. We'll move on now to Chancellor uh, Grasso for the Dearborn campus budget. Uh, thank you, President Schlissel. Uh, I also want to thank you very much for your investment in the two campuses. As Chancellor Dutta said, this will be very helpful to our student success initiatives, which are the cornerstone of our strategic which is the cornerstone of our strategic plan. I'd like to start by first thanking my team, uh, Vice Chancellor Evans and Provost Alcock, who were very instrumental in helping put this budget together. Our budget is based on a strategic and quantitative assessment of uh, projected revenues and expenses for the coming year. And as Provost Collins and Chancellor Dutta said, a lot is still very uncertain and we're facing many challenges as a result of the economic downturn, COVID, and a variety of other factors. We uh, engaged in a very aggressive and uh, cost-cutting and cost containment exercise, keeping a significant eye on preserving student success and the student experience and academic excellence. And we were very successful in identifying a, a variety of different cost-cutting measures that uh, we've talked about in previous uh, meetings. Um, so our uh, plan is based on a constant uh, state appropriation and 89% uh, of our state appropriation is directly uh, uh, committed to financial aid. So 89% of our uh, state appropriation goes directly to students and we're increasing this year our financial aid by 11%. We're also going to block tuition, which means that any students who take 12 or more credits pay only one rate for tuition. So if you take 12 credits or 18 credits, you only pay one rate for that uh, tuition and it uh, will allow our students to graduate much more quickly and more efficiently and cost effectively. The cost difference between going from a, a four-year graduation rate, which they'll be able to do, uh, and a five-year graduation rate will, will save the students over $13,000. We're requesting a 1.9% increase, a modest increase in our tuition for undergraduates, a 4.2% for non-residents, and a 5% increase in uh, our graduation rate. The, the, the undergraduate 1.9% amounts to $124 per semester. And with that, I'd like to conclude my remarks and be happy to answer any questions. Oh, let me just respond to uh, Regent Bernstein who asked uh, how we would invest uh, some of the resources that you're committed. We've been doing a lot of thinking on this. We've been in a strategic planning effort for over a year now. So uh, we are actually in a good position to, to offer some ideas. We would certainly uh, transform and enhance our undergraduate student experience. Uh, one of the, our big challenges is our graduation rate. We want to make sure that we can, we can uh, nurture our students and usher them across the finish line. So we would invest in tutoring, career services, uh, counseling, software programs that would help guide the students. We would also help uh, reorganize our financial aid structure, which we're doing right now, so that we can better serve our need-based students. And uh, to also answer a question, about 82% of our students, all of our students get uh, financial support at the university. So I'd be happy to answer any other uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Chancellor Grasso. Other uh, questions uh, uh, for or comments for the uh, Dearborn campus and Chancellor Grasso? Uh, Chancellor Grasso, with our, I was surprised uh, earlier this week when you and I talked 
Could you explain to everyone of the state appropriation that U of M Dearborn receives uh, the approximate amount that's uh, used toward uh, student aid? Uh, we, uh, this year, our state appropriation is about $23 million, uh, and uh, of that, 89% uh, goes directly to financial aid, which uh, I, I still do not think is enough. Uh, I want to increase our financial support for our students, and that is one of my, uh, uh, that is my top priority when I do fundraising for the campus. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Beam. Other uh, questions before we move forward? Very good. I now call upon uh, Dr. Spollinger, who will present a budget recommendation for the University of Michigan Health System and U of M Health. Dr. Spollinger. Thank you, Dr. Schussel. Could I have the first slide? Um, so I have the opportunity to present the health system um, and UM Health operating projections. We call it projections because of the uncertainty this year, but it is essentially our budget. Could I have the next slide, please? please. So I wanna thank, first of all, all our uh, physicians, nurses, physical therapists, respiratory therapists, environmental service workers, uh, and supply chain that uh, enabled us to successfully meet the challenges of the first wave of the pandemic over this uh, spring. Um, and I think without their um, volunteerism, without their long hours of working, um, we would have not been able to come through uh, that first wave as well as we did. Um, so I'll move to the next slide. Just to give you a sense of the challenges we had, uh, we ramped down all our non-emergent services, which had a significant impact on revenue. We expanded our ICU beds from 107 to 260 and redeployed staff, both nurses and physicians, to cover those intensive care units. Developed our own in-house testing for COVID, but then didn't have swabs or viral transport media, so we developed 3D printing to create our own swabs and our pharmacy made our own viral transport media so we could do testing. Because of the challenges of masks, we developed a reprocessing protocol for our N95 in order to maintain masks for everybody. And we were the first hospital, uh, major hospital in the country, one day ahead of Mass General to require masks from everyone since uh, there were people were just as likely to get uh, ill from their coworkers as they were from the patients. And we streamlined the patient transfer process, both to reduce exposure of our workers, as well as to improve the speed with which we can accept transfers from Southeastern Michigan. Next slide. That truly became life-saving as um, people may or may not know that uh, uh, COVID, when somebody <clears throat> becomes very ill, they become ill very quickly. And so the rapid transport enabled us to take over 800 trans, trans, um, transport, uh, transports from Southeastern Michigan hospitals in this seven week period that's outlined here. Um, we were able to do things directly from emergency rooms and directly from ICUs. 60% uh, of the transfers were intensive care uh, patients and 72% of our patient days during this period of time were intensive care. At one point, uh, we had around 230 uh, patients, of which over, a, over 160 were on ventilators. Next slide. I also wanna thank the community. You can see in the corner here our uh, donation center where the community provided meals, coffee, um, an emergency medical needs fund, and, uh, and per personal protective equipment for our, for our uh, staff. And uh, we, we really truly thank the community. Next slide. All this had an impact, however, on our finances. Um, as of March 15th, we were, on, we were on pace to have an $18 million March margin and on pace to have $175 million <clears throat> um, operating margin for the fiscal year. By the end of March, we had lost $45 million. We were losing $44 million a day caring for COVID patients and, and the ramp down of our operations so that our estimated actual 
um, operating margin for year end was a, uh, was a loss of 139 million after just uh, two months earlier, projecting 175 million positive. Next slide. We did, however, receive some government assistance during this period of time of 136 million, which offset our, our projection of $139 million loss to our projection that right now is of a $3 million loss for this year. That still is 172 million less than what we were projected to have at the middle of March. Next slide. For an FY21, we originally forecast a $26 million loss, uh, but we implemented a number of things. We implemented uh, no um, uh, salary program for, uh, for uh, non-bargain for faculty and staff. And we also suspended um, retirement contributions for one year which is, a, and, and executives took a pay cut, which was a $70 million savings projected for next year. So our new uh, current operating projection is a $44 million margin. We do continue to look at additional cost reduction uh, strategies, and we have uh, essentially 2,000 line item plans that we are working our way through but it's still, still too early to say the total of that, but it would be in north of $200 million. But there is still significant risk in executing that, those plans. Uh, so we are not including it in, in the budget. Next slide. We still have potential risks. There is, we most certainly believe there'll be a resurgence of COVID. Hopefully it won't be uh, like the first surge, and we've learned a lot in how to manage both COVID and non-COVID patient. There may be unexpected changes in utilization patterns post-pandemic. Uh, we also um, are concerned about the legislative environment, whether we will get any additional legislative relief or whether there'll be some changes in um, reimbursement rates going forward, we know there'll be changes in payer mix, uh, there'll be an increase in, there's already an increase in bad debt and Medicaid, and uh, our relationship with payers may change. Next slide. We continue to balance uh, being a statewide resource for COVID patients, uh, both, and, and we are trying to also deal with the surge of non-COVID patient needs that had been delayed during this period of time. For example, we had 14,000 surgeries delayed during this three month period of time. Um, and we want to continue to improve on patient and employee safety, reduce health disparities, and support our education and research mission going forward. Next slide. In conclusion, we remain steadfast, committed to our patients, employees, and community. And our projections is an overview of our current financial situation as we seek to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. There remains significant uncertainty, um, but we believe that we can continue to navigate um, the ups and downs of, of the, and the uncertainties as we move forward. We closed the command center this past week, but we have replaced it with a management structure that is more like a command center in order to respond quickly to changes in the environment and uh, if, if need be. Um, and we will successfully navigate the unpredictable forces going forward and hopefully emerge a stronger health system. And I can answer any questions that you have. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Spollinger. Questions uh, for Dr. Spollinger? Uh, not a question, just a comment. I want to thank you, Dr. Spollinger, and everyone at Michigan Medicine for what they've done uh, and how hard they've worked over the last several months. They're, they're truly heroes, and, and we can never thank them enough for, for what they've contributed to the community and the citizens of Michigan. Thank you. I add something as well, President Schultz. Yeah, please, please, please on, Jordan. On, on top of that, I, I wanted to add a comment on that. Um, Dr. Spollinger, you know, I, I am not just a region, I'm also a patient of the university hospital. And I I, uh, I went last week for my appointment and, and I well, the one thing that I was struck by with, was how I heard from everyone how uh, quickly 
and steadfastly, your team had moved to keep the employees safe. And like you said, uh, the number of people acquiring COVID uh, as employees was very low on the medicine campus. And I think that speaks to the dedication you had, not just to treating your patients, which is of course, uh, job one, but also keeping everyone safe. And so you should be really commended for that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Regent Acker. Uh, other comments before we move forward to athletics? Okay, thank you. Uh, I now call upon Athletic Director Ward Manuel to present the budget for our athletic department. Ward. Thank you, Dr. Schlissel. Uh, good morning to the regents, uh, members uh, of the executive officers and uh, the media and the public. Um, it's good to be with you uh, in a tough time for us all, uh, but uh, being together is always uh, more positive so we can push through this. Um, just going to go over uh, just an overview of 2020. We got through about two thirds of the year uh, before uh, the schedules were disrupted. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just a general overview of, of expectations that we we talk about all the time. Uh, and uh, I am proud of the student athletes uh, this year. Uh, the one thing that they did, uh, even through uh, the disruption of, of going back home and moving online, uh, is when in the classroom, we won on the field. They, they are great young people, uh, and they're doing everything within the rules. We, we should all be proud uh, and having a lot of fun uh, doing it. Next slide, please. Um, unprecedented year, just uh, the staff picked out some pictures of uh, former student athletes who uh, are also in the medical field. And so like everybody else, very proud of what Michigan Medicine has done, the staff there, uh, our, our public service uh, workers who, who have worked tirelessly, tirelessly to, to help get us through this safely and health and, and, and with our health. Uh, and so these are just uh, three former uh, student athletes. I will point out that Chris Hutchinson in the bottom left I was a former teammate of mine. He was a few years younger than me, and his son Aiden uh, is now uh, on the football team and playing as well. So, uh, very proud of of him, of both of them. Next slide. Academic highlights. We we just had a great year again um, uh, amongst our teams and what they're doing from a, a APR. Uh, in achievement in the awards, point out that basketball, men's basketball, ninth consecutive year being in the top 10% of the academic performance rate for all teams across the country. Um, and 405 academic all Big Ten honorees, uh, and then over uh, 335, uh, and this was before the um, uh, spring term had ended at the time, uh, 335 student athletes above a 3.0. I believe that number is above uh, 400 at this point. Uh, next slide, please. So athletically, uh, we ended the, the year. We were on, on track uh, for great, uh, tremendous success in the spring. Um, and you could see the Big Ten championships we had from this year. Uh, and then the national uh, top 10 finishes uh, in those sports that are listed. Um, and so it, it was a great year. Uh, you know, they cut it off, but again, we were in the top uh, 10 in the uh, NACT of the Learfield Directors Cup, which me measures how you, you balance uh, in, in terms of success in men's and women's sports. Uh, and we were moving uh, into a, a direction where we would have been in the top five again, uh, as we have been, I believe, in three of the past four or five years. So uh, next slide. And then just highlight this graduating class, amazing uh, young men and women. Uh, and you can see what they have achieved collectively uh, as a group uh, in a four, four to five year uh, span. Uh, just very proud of, uh, of this class and what they, have, uh, what they have achieved. Next slide, please. Next slide. So um, this year in, in 2020, just to compare, um, we 
you know, stopped in March. Uh, and because we stopped in March, we had a decrease um, in the NCAA revenues that were distributed across the country. Uh, and then we also uh, had a process where we stopped uh, and paused uh, and moved our timelines for payment uh, of preferred seed contributions, much to what has already been said about the economy and what's happening with families, our fans. Uh, and so being uh, understanding of that, uh, we paused and changed that process and it's on hold right now uh, in terms of the, the ticket purchasing process. Um, so, but along with that, we had a significant decrease in uh, expenses uh, of somewhere near $8 million in savings because our teams weren't traveling, we weren't participating, our staff wasn't traveling, uh, we weren't hosting games. So there, there was significant decrease uh, in our expenditures uh, for this year. So uh, we're projecting as we close out uh, this month uh, an operating surplus um, for this fiscal year. However, uh, next slide, uh, because of what we're uh, looking uh, at for this year, coming up in a disruption uh, to uh, our season, uh, what we're projecting in revenues is down uh, almost uh, $65 million from last year. Um, and then our operating expenses, we're reducing, uh, already reduced about 49, um, uh, $39 million, I should say, in operating uh, expenses. Uh, and so it is a year where we are going to, we're projecting a deficit of 26 million. We have, uh, reserves and worked, uh, with, uh, our CFO, Kevin uh, Hegarty and, and the president on a, uh, uh, debt service plan, uh, as well uh, to cover it. But I did want to just, uh, bring to, uh, the board an understanding of exactly the impact that could be had uh, on this season uh, from a uh, revenue and operating expense uh, standpoint. Uh, we have great uh, fans, we have great donors, we have uh, great staff uh, that are all pulling together to uh, reduce as best we can uh, this deficit uh, and to mitigate it. But we, we also have to plan uh, that people, if we, depending on the number of games we play, if we play games uh, this year, uh, the potential for refunds uh, being requested or money moved to next year uh, in terms of uh, purchasing tickets. Uh, and we want to make sure we keep this as a one year problem uh, and not spend money this year um, that is really intended or pushed to next year. So uh, there's a lot of still a lot of, uh, you know, sort of uh, turbulence about what's going to happen. We don't really uh, know. Uh, we have multiple models, although I'm presenting uh, one to you, uh, but we will, we will adjust accordingly uh, and move forward. So I, I want to give a lot of credit to my staff, my coaches, our student athletes. Uh, they are uh, sticking together, working hard, uh, doing the things that we need to do uh, to continue to, to work our way through this. Um, as we have brought student athletes back, uh, they are following the staff and the student athletes who are already back are following the protocols we have in place. Uh, they have been wonderful uh, about it uh, and we just need to keep staying diligent in uh, to see how uh, we would uh, we would continue to uh, practice and uh, participate in, in competition if we get to that point. So um, that completes my presentation, Dr. Slosson. Thank you very much, uh, Director Manuel. Uh, questions or, or comments for uh, Ward? Questions on the athletics budget? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so what we'll now do is move on to a vote on the consolidated budget for the university and we'll ask in a moment for um, a, a motion and a second, and then we'll open it up for discussion, and then we'll take a final vote. Uh, so is there a motion for approval of the revenue and expenditure operating budgets for FY 2021, which includes all the budgets presented this morning? 
this is this is Regent Weiser. I so move. Thank you, Regent Weiser. Is there a second? Support. Uh, thank you. Uh, discussion. Yeah, I. Regent Bernstein. Whoop, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead, Michael. It's okay. I'm I'll sorry, Mike. I didn't see you. Please go ahead. Oh, no problem. I would just a couple of things, and uh, this is coming from someone who, when I was newly married, uh, my wife and I had over a hundred thousand uh, dollars in student loan debt. So when people talk about debt, uh, I feel it. Uh, and when we talk about a tuition increase, I think it's important to note that the people that uh, if you're an in-state student and your family has an income up to $170,000 uh, that you will not be receiving uh, this tuition increase. Uh, and when, if we don't vote for this budget, uh, that it, uh, to use some terms that are analogous, like in the tax world, there's a difference between an income tax and then uh, something like uh, a service tax when you buy a good uh, or, you know, uh, just a, a, a tax uh, on, on, on goods like at the grocery store. And if we don't uh, vote for this uh, tuition increase with this budget, then all of the monies uh, that would be derived from this increase then are spread out to those who least can afford uh, to pay for these things. And so it would be the person receiving student aid uh, who would then have increased costs. costs. And that's why I think it's very important here uh, to vote for this uh, budget because the tuition increase uh, will be borne by those who can afford to pay it uh, and not uh, carried by uh, those who can least afford uh, to pay for it. Uh, uh, thank you. Regent Bernstein was queued up next. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, you know, I, this is always a, a challenging decision, and it's even more so at this moment. Um, and I want to just uh, say very generally, uh, and then address uh, about, say very generally, um, you know, how important my philosophy, which I've articulated before, but I think it's very important to appreciate, is that for me, uh, you know, we use a very small tuition increase uh, as proposed to keep college affordable for those students who need the most help, um, the most financial help. And so those who, I just believe fundamentally that those who can pay more uh, should pay more. Uh, so that those who can't pay more don't have to pay more. Um, and we have approximately, and, and the provost and, or others can, 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 can correct me if I'm wrong, but 70% of our students in Ann Arbor are receiving some form of significant financial aid. That's a, a, a in, very large number of students. Um, and um, any grievance about the systemic challenges that the university faces with respect to funding separate from COVID um, need to be made to state government and to federal government that have just defunded higher education and all of education for that matter for years and years. We absolutely have a responsibility to be responsible, to be disciplined, to be deliberate um, and to be thoughtful about how we spend money. Um, but I fundamentally believe that um, to not raise tuition in a very modest way at this moment deprives the university of the resources to spend that money in desperately needed financial aid for the students who need it. Um, with respect to uh, Flint and Dearborn, I, I'm certain that I speak on behalf of everybody on this board um, that we are deeply concerned about issues related to um, equity and um, fairness on those campuses when it comes to um, the success of our students. Um, also recognizing that those campuses face very unique challenges, each one different um, from the next. Um, and so through all of this, you know, many of our students, faculty, staff, and their allies have been deeply and effectively involved 
and advocating for smart and equitable investment in these campuses at Flint and in Dearborn. And this progress, I think, that is reflected in the plans that uh, the chancellors have outlined um, and that need more detail um, and more work um, that will occur. Um, and the investment that President Schlissel introduced at the very beginning of our meeting uh, is a good start for now. It's, I don't believe it's enough, but it's an important down payment on the programs and efforts that are necessary to address the unique challenges that these campuses and the students on these campuses face. And I believe that this money will jumpstart the funding for programs necessary to address the enrollment retention and completion challenges on these campuses. And so for those reasons, uh, I intend to vote yes on this budget. Uh, thank you, Regent Bernstein. Uh, other comments or questions? I have a yes, question. Regent Diggs. Thank you. So, Vice President Churchill, can you explain the difference? Um, you know, we used to vote sort of in, on, on the separate portions of the budget, but now we vote only on the consolidated. Can you explain that for the public, please? I'll do the best I can, and then I, I may, uh, I, if there's any <clears throat> clarification from uh, General Counsel Lynch, I'm happy to turn the floor over to him. So in the past, there used to be, I don't know, eight or nine different votes on different parts of the budget and including a vote on, for example, a student fee that might be a dollar increase or something like that. And then there was always also a vote on the consolidated budget, which is the omnibus um, consolidated budget. And Vice President Haggerty can describe it better than I, but it's everything. It's all the auxiliaries, it's a general fund budget, it's athletics, it's housing, it's fees, it's all three campuses, it's the health system, it's everything. It's everything you've heard today and maybe some things you haven't heard today. That's the consolidated budget. So a number of years ago, a decision was made. There was always a little confusion about this issue. So a number of years ago, a decision was made to um, have one vote on the overall budget, recognizing that um, some people may not be happy with parts of it, may have different thoughts about parts of it, uh, some of the details. Um, maybe you don't like the athletics budget, for example. I'll pick on <clears throat> our AD for a moment. And, and certainly free to say that in the record and comment and opine on your thoughts on that part of the budget, or you may really like a part, you may not like a part. I, and you're certainly free in, um, to comment on that and say that and express your views. And that is all part of the official record. Uh, but at the end, there is one vote and it's up or down on the entire budget, um, not parts. And um, that's my explanation. I hope it's helpful, but uh, Vice President Lynch, is there anything you wish to add or Vice President Haggerty, if I haven't explained it well? Uh, no, Vice President Churchill, I, I don't have anything to add. I think that covers it. Nothing to add from me, Vice President Churchill. Okay. Well, thank you for that explanation. Uh, and it's very helpful because it does describe the challenges that I feel uh, on this budget because there's some parts of the budget that I really agree with and appreciate all the hard work around, and there are other parts of the budget that I do not. Um, and this is the first time I think that I really have had to weigh those, those two different or really what, nine different pieces, parts. Um, I think the uncertainty that lies before us is something that really causes me to pause. And the information that we've been able to receive to date is honestly somewhat limited just because of the circumstances, right? I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. There are no true numbers. These are all projections done by the best minds. Um, and so I appreciate the projections, but the uncertainty really um, is a challenge for me. Thank you, Regent Diggs. Those are thoughtful comments. Thank you. Uh, other uh, questions or comments before I uh, call for a vote? Uh, I, yes, uh, Regent Brown, thank you. Sorry. Um, I, I, I concur with everything that's been said by my colleagues for the most part, um, especially the wise words by Regent Illich early in the meeting. Um, I just want uh, everyone to be clear that I'm not 
uh, so much a tuition hawk as I am a affordability hawk. Um, and unfortunately, state government, as, as Regent uh, Bernstein has said, has, has all but abandoned its major role in funding the majority of tuition. Uh, therefore, I'm not opposed to the increases, uh, to increases in tuition for those who are fortunate to be able to afford it, uh, especially if those increased revenues are used to support students with less ability to pay in order to make the tuition more affordable to them. And I want to commend, commend the staff uh, and the administration um, for doing that with this tuition proposed tuition increase. Um, but uh, also, um, as many of you know, uh, the board and the administration has been working very hard to develop and fund a plan uh, to make Flint and Dearborn uh, campuses wildly successful for uh, its students and community. And I've been clear that I do not think we have invested enough um, in those two campuses. Um, and the fact of the matter is that this is a consolidated budget um, and we lack line item veto, uh, so to speak. Um, so I have to weigh all of the aspects uh, of this budget. Um, and in short, uh, in making that uh, measurement, um, I come out in, not in support of the current budget in plan. Uh, Thank you. So before uh, calling for a vote, I just want to offer a, a brief comment. You know, in a typical year, uh, I speak to the board about the investments necessary to maintain and enhance academic excellence at the University of Michigan. Uh, your stewardship and 200 years of investment by the state of Michigan uh, has resulted in uh, the top public research university in the country. As we look around ourselves in the state of Michigan, there are very few things we could any longer say are the top in the nation, although we aspire for the state uh, to resume its position as the founder of the middle class for the United States, the home of a thriving auto and manufacturing industry, a place where a person could get a great public education and then a great university education, uh, I'd argue that we're not doing very well as a state in, in that regard. Uh, however, uh, I think uh, it would go without saying, not just in a room full of Michigan alumni and regents, but around our state, that the University of Michigan is a jewel of the state of Michigan. And it's really been the collective commitment of not just this group of eight regents, but the uh, many, many, many regions that have preceded them through the 202 year history of the university, uh, the ongoing commitment to excellence uh, that's resulted in what our fellow uh, uh, residents of the state can now benefit from and that places benefits out into the world. Uh, do the subtraction test. What would the state of Michigan be like without the University of Michigan as a top public research university. And it's a very difficult thing to consider. Uh, this year, however, I'm not asking for an investment in increased academic excellence. We don't have the money and we're in the middle of a global pandemic whose end uh, is uncertain. And we're in the middle of the most severe recession, certainly of my life, um, with tremendous uncertainty looking forward. What I'm asking for from the board is the ability to have confidence in the executive team and invest along with us in the continuation of the University of Michigan, in our prioritization of keeping kids in school, in taking the, the dollars that you're voting to give us in this budget to provide special financial aid to families whose circumstances have changed, uh, to make sure that the bad luck of all of us, you know, it's nobody's fault that we're in the middle, certainly not here, no one's fault that we're in the middle of a terrible pandemic. It's not the fault of unemployed residents of the state. It's not the fault of the students who are going to school right now. It's not the fault of the regents or the executive leadership of the university, but it's our responsibility to make sure we steward the university on behalf of all of those constituencies and to make sure that we have the money to invest in keeping kids in school so this doesn't become a lost generation. Uh, the resources we're investing in Ann Arbor and the supplemental resources for Flint and Dearborn uh, will uh, endeavor to make sure that this terrible pandemic uh, doesn't have effects that last 
a lifetime for the young people who whose window of time uh, is really now. Uh, the other reason to invest in the university now uh, is health and safety. So in order to have students come back to Ann Arbor, in order to have our researchers in the labs, in order to have our staff who have to come to work be safe, we need to be able to invest in the public health informed safety measures uh, that uh, are necessary best practices uh, in order to keep the university moving forward. Um, we have endeavored to maintain the employment of people at the university, regardless of this terrible economy, and we're trying our very best to do this. Great sacrifices have been made by people all across the institution. Uh, the signal of not supporting a budget with such a de minimis increase uh, in the presence of these great difficulties in our society, uh, the commitment not to have aided students have to uh, uh, bear the brunt of a 1.9% increase in cost, uh, and the commitment to invest in keeping kids in school and keeping our, our students and our faculty and staff safe while they carry out the mission of the university in this time of uncertainty is very important, and that's my strongest argument. Uh, for supporting the consolidated budget of the University of Michigan, at the same time that I make a personal commitment to the regents to continue to work together, to work with our new committee focused on the regional campuses, to develop thoughtful and strategic ways to invest in their future success, to develop budget models that support their future success. Uh, there's no investment that Ann Arbor could make if, if enrollment continues to dwindle on regional campuses that will keep those campuses strong and viable. So we need to be strategic and we need to be collaborative here. Um, and that takes time, it takes goodwill, and, and uh, uh, certainly I pledge my part in working together to assure uh, that that happens in the months and years ahead. Uh, I don't subscribe in magical thinking, you know, hoping that we don't have to do things and saying that we shouldn't charge for things that are important to charge for, that's not a strategy, at least for me, because you know, I'm ultimately responsible for implementation. And so you know, I thank uh, the regents for their incredibly thoughtful approach to this budget. We've had many conversations about this over many, many months, and we are where we are now, and tomorrow we'll still be a university working together, uh, struggling to fulfill our mission on behalf of our students, and then all the residents of the state and dare I say the nation and the world uh, that are counting on us. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I will go ahead and call for a vote unless there is further discussion. I have some further discussion, just some initial thoughts for you, uh, President. Of Schultz. course, Regent Acker, thank you. Um, so, and I, I wanna say, first of all, uh, to you and to your executive team, I really appreciate um, all of the work that you've put in over the last couple of months, really since uh, our March meeting, uh, we had no idea how hard this was going to hit our campus so hard and so quickly. And the work that you and your team did uh, to, to move us online was really yeoman's work. And I want to first applaud you for that. And I want to echo second uh, what Regent Illich said. I thought that her, uh, her thoughts on this were profound. I thought they were absolutely right for the moment. But also, uh, I, I agree normally with Regent Bernstein. I think that in a normal year, um, thoughts about raising tuition on the most well-off of students to, uh, to fund all of these other things that, that make our university great is important. Um, and I, I understand it, but I, then I think about the numbers and I look at my senior year at the university, which was 2005, I guess it was not that long ago, uh, we, I pay ten thousand dollars today. That's over fifteen uh, for an in-state student. Um, I look at where the economy has gone. I look at where jobs are in the state. Uh, unemployment is massive. Uh, we face two severe downturns in that, and I, and uh, yet I look at this budget, and all I see is not opposition but uncertainty. Um, you know, for everywhere from the Flint. Uh, in Dearborn campus to the Ann Arbor campus. Uh, I think about what this fall is going to look like and I appreciate and I believe that in your role as president, President just you should be uh, optimistic about what the fall looks like. Um, but I feel maybe as a board member that I should be a little pessimistic, a little more realistic about what that looks like. 
Um, I think we would be extraordinarily lucky to get through a semester. Uh, I think we'd be extraordinary. I, I think it's quite frankly near impossible that we see fans in our football stadium in the fall. Um, and the semester, whatever it looks like, is going to look very, very different. Um, and so I find myself uh, there and also thinking that we could do more, um, that we could do more uh, to not put the burden on our students this year, to put the burden elsewhere. Um, because ultimately, like Regent Illich said, I think that um, we can continue to uh, do what we need to do in Flint and in Dearborn. Uh, and also not break our commitments for student aid in Ann Arbor. Um, so those are just my initial thoughts right now, but I, I, I do, um, I do want to echo Regent uh, Ryder Diggs because I think she really, she really hits on an important point that uh, the uncertainty is perhaps the most difficult part of, of voting for this budget. Um, and I do appreciate, by the way, I think that it, it's great to hear your commitment um, in this meeting, President Sussel, uh, over the next year, I'd like to see that commitment. And uh, we talk a lot uh, internally about uh, transparency. I know I am a big transparency hawk. I think over the next year, we need to do a lot of work to show our work when it comes to the investments in the Flint and Dearborn campus, wh whose students deserve just as much as it on the Ann Arbor campus. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Regent Acker. Uh, other uh, thoughts or comments? Uh, Chancellor Dutta, you're still on mute, Chancellor Dutta. Hi. Uh, so while we are still on the budget, I wanted to close the loop with uh, with Regent Bernstein. You asked me what's the what percentage of students at U of M Flint get aid. That number for the last few years has been about 70 percent, and the average institutional aid that I I refer to is in the 1800s. Thank you very much. Uh, other comments and questions? All right, yeah, uh, the last comment I'll make before uh, calling the vote uh, is, you know, I am very sensitive, as many of you have pointed out, to the state of the economy this year and the, the difficulty uh, in uh, having a tuition increase or the uh, what Regent Illich called tone deafness, you know, so that is a very sensitive point and the economy now is far worse than any of us imagined uh, that it would be. Uh, like most things though, uh, you know, the uh, effects are disproportionate, they're inequitable. Uh, the people that we're calling upon to pay an extra $400 or so or $300 actually aren't the ones who are being affected by this awful economy. Uh, and the reason we're asking them to do that is so we can maintain the excellence of the university while at the same time supporting those who have been disproportionately affected uh, by the pandemic. Uh, and then one final point, last year, every year we have a, a challenge around tuition. And I agree completely that, you know, the eight or nine years ago when Regent Acker graduated school, it was less expensive. The 40 years ago when Regent Weiser graduated school, it was way less expensive. Uh, I would say the University of Michigan today is getting the same support from the state that it got 20 years ago. Uh, and, um, you know, the university has yet to recover from the last round of budget cuts. Uh, this budget projects a flat state allocation. I'd be willing to bet anybody at dinner that it won't be a flat allocation. Uh, it'll be a greater allocation. And then finally, last year when we struggled over the budget, uh, we were struggling with raising tuition in a year where the economy in the state of Michigan was as good as we're probably going to see it in our lifetimes. The unemployment rate was hovering below 4%. The great rate of growth in personal income was way higher than inflation. And we struggled that year. So I'd argue it's always difficult to ask people to pay for value. Uh, it's particularly difficult, you know, when we're uh, representing a, a large economy where people have very diverse capacities. Uh, so I'll, I'll end with that and I'll, I'll run uh, the roster on this vote uh, since um, we're doing this virtually. Uh, and the vote now is on the consolidated budget of every component of the University of Michigan, health system, athletics, all three campuses and all of our auxiliaries. Uh, Vice President Churchill, did you want to say something? Yes, I apologize. 
for interrupting you mid-sentence, but I just got a text that I believe Regent White has joined the call. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I will call Regents White's name in turn when we get down to that uh, section. Uh, so first I call Regent Acker, yay or nay? Nay. Regent Beam? Yay. Thank you. Regent Bernstein? Aye. I'm sorry, Mark. One more time? Yes. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry my hearing there. Uh, Regent Brown? No. Regent Ryder Diggs? No. Regent Illich? No. Thank you. Regent Weiser? Yes. Regent White, if you're on the line? Yes. Uh, thank you. So uh, as I counted, and correct me if I'm wrong, Vice President and Churchill, the University of Michigan does not have a budget uh, because we have a four to four vote. Is that correct? That is correct. It, it, it requires a simple majority of the quorum, and um, it's it's a tie. So that very, is correct. Uh, very good. So I have, uh, I have so, a comment. Yeah, please, Regent Diggs. So you know, I appreciate all of the comments. You know, your thoughtful comments as well as the comments of my fellow regents. Um, and I have to tell you, I've given this a, a lot of thought as we've been working through this budget process for the last few months and even all night last night. Um, but I did, you know, actually write a couple prepared remarks as I was thinking through everything. Um, and so I'd like to read those into the record. Um, the budget process spans many months and involves the work of faculty and staff in every department in school. It's a thoughtful process that weighs the needs and opportunities, critically reviews expenses, and plans the investments for the future. It sharpens our conversation around issues that frankly, I think are wonderful to discuss as intensely throughout the year. The budget is a statement of the values of our institution. Of course, this year, our budget process was abruptly upended by the coronavirus pandemic as it swept through changing all of our lives. Across the state, as students returned home to complete school virtually, businesses shuttered, employees were furloughed, friends and family members were hospitalized and lives were lost. We all quarantined until the first wave passed. Now, as we slowly reopen, our institutions of higher learning are on the forefront helping pave the way to our new normal. I believe that with the uncertainties of the year ahead, we need to focus on the safety of our campuses and communities, quality education for our students, and life-saving research and healthcare. I believe that we can focus on these priorities and maintain and even exceed the educational quality of the past with innovation, collaboration across the country with other like institutions and diligence. But I do not support increasing tuition when families are facing the economic uncertainties of possible recurrent furloughs, unemployment, family illness, and difficulties with small business and household responsibilities. Although I appreciate our sort of sticker price versus discounted tuition rate as we provide this incredible financial aid, I believe that families with these realities often fall through the cracks of our financial aid system because of the structure of our federal student aid forms. I'm proud of the incredible work that we've done to provide high levels of financial aid to offset higher tuition on the Ann Arbor campus. But in these times, I actually don't think it's going to be enough with the economic uncertainties and the structure of our aid process. As family members go through these uncertainties in the next few months, I think it's going to be difficult for us to assess and decide which families are really receiving the financial aid and which ones won't. The Ann Arbor campus entered the pandemic in a very good financial position. And as the president just stated, this increase in tuition is actually de minimis. With the information that I have now, I believe our priorities can be met with a budget that does not increase tuition. My understanding is this increase in tuition for the Ann Arbor campus 
will provide an additional $17 million. I believe that we can provide these monies if needed in other ways. As a region, I have consistently supported the budgets and invested in our campuses. I acknowledge that we have, as regions can vote differently on the budget because we differ on how best to achieve the same goals and aspirations. I do wanna thank the leadership team for their work on the budget to improve student academic success and engage learning, student support services, particularly mental health services and infrastructure. But the uncertainty surrounding the details of the hybrid academic fall semester, which albeit are difficult to provide because we just don't know what's going to happen in our future. With that, along with the pandemic and its economic impact, compel me to believe that a tuition increase for the Ann Arbor campus is not in the best interest of the institution nor the people of the state at this time. Regarding the U of M Flint campus, this campus to me is different because it's had significant challenges as a result of the Flint water crisis, changing population and decreasing enrollment, and now the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, of the 15 colleges and universities in our state, U of M Flint has the third lowest tuition in the state. And most of the students do not have campus housing expenses. The majority of in-state students receive financial aid, including 48% of students who are Pell eligible, who end up paying less than $1,000 a year for tuition. These students would receive additional aid and all students would have fees eliminated to offset the $243 tuition increase. So there really would be no additional burden on our students. I believe that substantial investment is needed in this campus for strategies to retain enrollment, increase financial aid, support faculty innovation, and develop new academic programs. I appreciate President Schlissel's commitment to invest $10 million in these improvements and with additional investments in student support and shared services in the next year. So I support that budget. But understanding our process, as outlined by Vice President Churchill, I voted no on the consolidated budget for the above reasons. So I believe that none of us can really foresee the future, and all of us are doing the best that we can with the information that we have. I do think that in the future, planning and consensus building will help us handle what lies before us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Diggs. Uh, so, you know, I've not been in this circumstance before. The university won't have a budget as of July 1st, but the executive team and the chancellors will go back and uh, redo uh, the budget and, you know, find uh, uh, ways to, uh, uh, I presume, uh, eliminate or diminish a tuition increase in Ann Arbor uh, and then deal with the consequences of that while we wait uh, uh, tens of millions of dollars of additional cuts from the state as well. Uh, so we'll bring back at our next meeting in July uh, a budget again for the University of Michigan, hopefully one that can achieve majority support. Uh, and until then, we'll live with further uncertainty and instability. Uh, but uh, you know, thank you for the seriousness with which you've all approached this incredibly important task. And I uh, respect everybody's comments uh, uh, those uh, who have reservations on the budget, as well as appreciating those who supported the budget and uh, that was put forward by the executive team. So thank you very much. And we'll move on on the agenda. Uh, I'd like to now uh, go back uh, to our uh, regular agenda and call upon uh, Regent Beam to provide a report of the first meeting of the Flint and Dearborn Committee. Uh, Regent Beam. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, after discussing uh, many issues involving the Flint and Dearborn campuses last year and into the first months of this year, uh, the board thought uh, those campuses' needs and more importantly, uh, the students uh, at Flint and Dearborn, uh, that their needs uh, were deserving of focused attention uh, of a board subcommittee. Uh, the board voted to approve the creation of the Flint and Dearborn subcommittee last month uh, and we've had the opportunity to meet uh, with the chancellors and have uh, a really uh, informative um, meeting uh, this month. Uh, it's the fourth subcommittee uh, of the university uh, in addition uh, to finance and audit 
uh, Student Life, and then also the Health Affairs Committee. Uh, our overarching mission uh, will involve a commitment to the Flint and Dearborn students in order to provide them with uh, the support to be successful in achieving students. Uh, you've heard uh, some of the uh, things that some of the regents and President Schlissel have said so far, and uh, those all encompass our thoughts, uh, such as a commitment uh, to progression in school through services such as academic advising, tutoring, career services, a commitment to the completion of the degree uh, to those who have left school, uh, a commitment uh, to removing the financial barriers of obtaining a college degree, uh, and a commitment to mental well being and creating a more inclusive campus environment uh, for our students. Those are all some of the ideas uh, that we've been discussing. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, the students and faculty from all three campuses uh, who have helped uh, shine a light on these important issues, and especially three students uh, Alicia Torino from the Flint campus, uh, Amy Tescurgis from the Ann Arbor campus and Amanda Sala uh, from the Dearborn campus. Uh, we're excited to continue our work uh, with Chancellors uh, Grasso and Dutta uh, and uh, the stakeholders of each campus. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Regent Beam. Uh, I now call upon uh, Regent Weiser uh, to uh, nominate uh, leadership for the board for the year ahead, starting in July. Regent Weiser. Yes, just one second. Um... The Regents bylaws state that the position of chair and vice chair rotate annually based on seniority until all members of the board have had the opportunity to serve as chair or vice chair. Following this provision, I move to the, the nomination of Regent Denise Illich as chair and Regent Jordan Acker as vice chair of the Board of Regents effective July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. And I want to tell you, it's been a pleasure for me to serve with my fellow regents, working with my fellow regents and with, and with you, President Schlissel. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Regent Weiser. Is there a motion to approve? Motion. Is there a second? Second. I can't hear a second. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor? And the comment? Aye. Comments before. Oh, I'm sorry. P please forgive me. I, I didn't think there'd be discussion about this choice, but please go ahead, Regent Brown. I just think maybe now would be an appropriate time to thank Regent Weiser for his service as chair. It was because of the variance and vagrancy of, of our system. He had to uh, be at the top for a little longer than normal, and he did a wonderful job, and it was an honor uh, to serve under him, so to speak. And I didn't ask his permission to say this beforehand, but I particularly want to uh, thank him for his, he and his wife's personal financial commitment uh, recently at the University of Michigan um, in, in several areas, especially around healthcare, and, and I, I won't reveal any details, um, but he's also been incredibly, always incredibly generous and willing to help um, our Flint and Dearborn campuses as well. And you can look up all of the ways in which he has been, uh, but it's really humbling um, um, to see. And I'm, I'm lucky to be his friend and lucky to be on the board uh, with him as chair. Thank uh, you. Thank and you, yes. Re Regent Brown. Uh, were there other comments before we take the vote? I, I would like to, President Schlissel. I, uh, I was going to say the same thing, but Regent Brown has somewhat stolen my thunder, though it's never the wrong time to reiterate um, the uh, thank you to Regent Weiser for his commitment to the university uh, over the past uh, 18 months or so. Um, you know, I, I, I uh, say as the youngest member of the board, talking to the oldest member of the board, that I appreciate not just his leadership, but also his mentorship over the past uh, year and a half. Uh, and I look forward to continuing to serve with him uh, and uh, over the next couple of years. So thank you, Regent Weiser, again. Uh, I'll thank just, you. I'll add one uh, ditto what Regent Bernstein and Acker said, but uh, also Regent Weiser, I really have appreciated how this past year under your leadership, we've added the committee that Regent Beam is uh, now chairing to really think about the three campuses more holistically 
and give equal attention to all three. And it was a, the suggestion, I believe, of, uh, I think it was Regent Bernstein, but I appreciate that under your leadership, you were able to start this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. Uh, any additional comments before we take our vote? Uh, all those in favor of uh, next year's chair and vice chair designations? Aye. 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 Okay, I'll, I'll consider that unanimous. Uh, congratulations, uh, Denise and Jordan. Uh, personal thanks also to Ron. We worked very closely and collaboratively uh, through the year and a half of, of Ron's service and the uh, uh, things you brought to board leadership are, are certainly palpable, and uh, I feel like I learned a lot from Ron uh, this best year as well. Uh, I look forward to working uh, with Denise. She was a very close partner in recent months uh, with Ron uh, on, uh, on organizing all the activities of the board, uh, and certainly I have never worked with someone with a more sincere commitment to the university than Regent Illich, so uh, I look forward to the year ahead. And uh, also to Regent Acker, uh, as he serves as vice chair and hopefully the year after as chair. So this is all wonderful renewal, uh, ongoing renewal of the board. So thank you all and congratulations very much. Uh, I'd now uh, like to shift the agenda and call on Regent Bernstein, who wishes to introduce a supplemental resolution. And he'll uh, introduce it. Uh, we'll uh, call for a, um, a second and then we'll discuss. Uh, so, Regent Bernstein, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Uh, before, I'd like to say a few things about this board resolution before making my uh, motion for the for the board to consider it. Um, this is a motion to uh, uh, regarding employer neutrality, cooperative determination, and, rec and recognition of bargaining units, and notification of agreements. Uh, it's a mouthful, and I'm going to have to, for technical reasons, read through this in a second. So, please uh, forgive me. Uh, we have deliberated on this for many months. Uh, both the board and administration have met several times to discuss labor issues at U of M generally and this particular proposal. Uh, as always, I'm grateful to my colleagues and the administration uh, for sharing their thoughtful views during this long process. Uh, this specific proposal was introduced uh, to my colleagues a number of times, but, uh, but all the way back to uh, February 5th of this year. Uh, I see this as an opportunity uh, to institutionalize an approach that will dramatically improve our relationship with employees and make labor organizing activity on our campuses more efficient. The most important feature of this resolution is the adopt and, and controversial aspect I, 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 I predict is the adoption of uh, a card check policy. Uh, card check is not new. Uh, since the National Re Labor Relations Act was passed back during the New Deal in the 19, roughly 1935, it's been legal for workers to form a union when a majority of employees in a bargaining unit sign cards indicating that they're in, their intent to bargain collectively with their employer. Then again, in 1969, the United States Supreme Court upheld the use of card check. Uh, and pardon my, me as uh, acting like a lawyer here, when Chief Justice Earl Warren wrote in his majority opinion in L NLRB versus Gissel Packing, I'm just quoting from the opinion, almost from the inception of the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act, it was recognized that a union did not have to be certified as the winner of a board election to invoke a bargaining obligation. It could establish majority status by other means, by showing convincing support for instance, by a union called strike or a strike vote, or as here in the case he was referring to, by possession of cards signed by a majority of the employees authorizing the union to represent them for collective bargaining purposes. Uh, fast forward to 2007, uh, when former President Barack Obama, then Senator Obama argued when, uh, when debating the Employee Free Choice Act, and I'm quoting, the current process for organizing a workplace denies too many workers the ability to do so. The Employee Free Choice Act offers to make binding an alternative process under which a majority of employees can sign up to join a union. Currently, employers can choose to accept but are not bound to by law to accept the signed decision of a majority of workers. He argued that choice should be left up to workers and workers alone. Card check is now used in a, about a dozen states and many, many more municipalities, all of which are thriving. Um, unions uh, and 
our associations and just a word just generally here about collective bargaining and unions. You know, unions are associations of individual workers who band together to collectively advance their shared interests. Of course, this university is part of many unions established to collectively advance our interests. We just use different names like the AAU or the NCAA or the Big Ten Conference. And with respect to these unions, how were they initially established? Well, we as an institution indicated an, an interest to establish these institutions. Sounds familiar. So how did the Big Ten get established? Essentially by card check. How did the NCAA get established? Essentially by card check. How did the AAU get established? Essentially institutionally by card check. So I'm proud and grateful to spearhead this victory for working families because I believe it benefits the university. I believe it benefits our state and I believe that it benefits our society. Uh, so now I'd like to move that the University of Michigan Board of Regents adopt the following. And I'm gonna read from this, um, this resolution, copies of which have, has been, have been distributed to, to my colleagues uh, and to the media, apparently. Um, the title is Board Resolution Regarding Employer Neutrality, Cooperative Determination and Recognition of Bargaining Units, and Notification of Agreements. And there are two, three, three pieces to it broadly. I'm just going to read. Employer Neutrality. The University of Michigan recognizes and supports the fundamental right of its employees to form unions and bargain collectively. The university and all of its agents acting in a supervisory role shall remain neutral on the issue of union representation in any organizing efforts by employees of the university and shall not express an opinion positive or negative about such efforts, nor will they provide employees with any information regarding unionization except that required by law. The university may distribute purely factual information to employees that corrects an inaccuracy or misrepresentation published by the union provided that the union fails to make the correction itself within two days <clears throat> following notification by the university. No university agent shall threaten, intimidate, discriminate against, retaliate against, or take any adverse action against any employee based on their decision to support or oppose forming a union. Two, cooperative determination and recognition of bargaining units. With regard to the determination of appropriate bargaining units, if a group of employees wishes to form or join a union, the union representing them may present a proposed bargaining unit to the university. The university will accept the bargaining unit proposed by the union as long as the proposed unit is reasonable. If the university asks for changes in the unit, representatives of the university and the union will work to reach agreement on disputed issues. At any time, either party may opt for a mutually approved arbitrator to make a binding decision solely on whether or not the proposed unit is reasonable under the Public Employee Employment Relations Act. Arguments will be presented to the arbitrator within two weeks following notification of this option, unless both parties agree to an extension. And the arbitrator shall issue their ruling within two weeks following. If the arbitrator determines the proposed unit is reasonable, the university will accept the proposed bargaining unit. If the arbitrator determines the proposed unit is not reasonable, the union may propose an alternative unit to the university. With regard to certification of bargaining units, once a bargaining unit has been determined, the university will recognize the union as the bargaining representative of the employees upon a showing of majority support of the employees in the bargaining unit, a practice commonly referred to as card check. Majority support will be verified by a mutually agreed upon process. Three, notification agreements. When an agreement is reached with regard to the determination of certification of a bargaining unit, the core elements of the agreement will be jointly communicated by the university and the union to all potential members of the bargaining unit, relevant supervisors, and any relevant third parties. The university will take all necessary steps to enforce these policies effective immediately. Uh, thank you, Regent Bernstein. I presume you're making the motion, so it requires a second? Second. That's correct. Thank you. Regent Acker has seconded. Uh, discussion. Um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to say that uh, I think I joined my first union when I was 18 years old and have been a part of several since. My uh, my lovely wife is a is a union member, 
I grew up in a union household. Uh, my mother was a teamster. Um, I have been uh, in management and on the obviously the employee side of several companies, some unionized and some not. Um, and I think some may see this as a dramatic word, but as Regent Bernstein pointed out, this is actually, if not typical, it's absolutely common, uh, both in our industry and across our economy. Um, and far from being dramatic, I think all it really does is clarify and streamline the process. Um, and if it does happen to result in increased union uh, membership on campus, I see that as a, a great thing uh, for our institution, for our students, our faculty and staff, for our community and for our state. So I'm very excited uh, to be in favor of, of codification of, of these policies. I'd like to uh, make- Thank you, Regent Brown. Regent Illich? I, yes, thank you. I just would like to remark that um, unions have a very deep history in our state and in our city. And I think very fondly of all of the union labor that built Comerica Park. Uh, I hope for the next year as chair, one thing I will try to be a positive influence on is increasing the re better relationships uh, between labor and our administration. I think that um, there is great room for improvement. I think there's commitment from both sides, but um, hopefully we will have a, a stronger uh, and more collaborative relationship in the in the year going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Illich. Uh, other comments, Regent Acker. Thank you, um, and I'm I'm proud to second this this motion today. Um, and I just want to I have a couple of comments that I'd like to make about it. Um, the first one is is that one of the things that I think makes our state and makes our university great is that we have this forward thinking tradition of labor relations. Uh, this is something that goes back decades, and I think that the codification of Regent Bernstein's motion here will only make that stronger. I think the the uh, ne neutrality is a very very strong uh, way forward, and it also. Uh, agree with Regent Bernstein that codification of card check or employee free choice is a really uh, is an important thing. And I, I expect that these will not only, as Regent Illich said, help uh, us uh, have better uh, labor management relations, but also serve as a model for other institutions on how we can uh, have those relations moving forward. So I'm proud to not just second this, but also to vote yes on it moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Acker. Uh, other comments uh, from Regents? Yes, I have one. Oh, can we turn to Regent Weiser, who's uh, on the phone? So we don't see him by video, but go ahead, Regent Weiser. First of all, I support neutrality, but I feel there's not been public input into this. And I also, I would like to propose an amendment, not as eloquent as my fellow regents, but in order to give full voice to every employee and follow the bedrock of this country's democracy for elections, secret ballots are an easy way to prevent coercion and intimidation. So I'd like to propose this amendment. With regard to certification of bargaining units, once a bargaining unit has been determined, the parties will agree to utilize the Merck election process, which provides for all employees in the proposed bargaining unit may vote by secret ballot as to whether they wish to represent, be represented by the proposed union and a simple majority will rule. So it's a lower threshold for employees because it only requires a simple majority, but it does give protection to employees from coercion and, and intimidation. Uh, thank you, Regent Weiser. Uh, uh, let me do what we did a moment ago. I'll call for a second on uh, this amendment uh, before leading to discussion. Is there a second on Regent Weiser's amendment? Okay, well, you know, hearing none, uh, if it's okay with the board, I'd like to make a, a comment uh, about my perspective on this really important point uh, and appreciate having worked with the board on this issue, uh, not this formal proposal, but that hasn't really been discussed uh, formally uh, for more than a matter of a few days, but the concepts certainly 
have been on the table for quite some time, discussed as a group, I mean, forgive me. So uh, throughout American history, unions have contributed to the economic success of our nation and to equitable treatment and prosperity of our workforce. Uh, growing up in New Jersey, I too was a union member as I worked for a supermarket chain as a cashier and as a clerk stocking shelves on the night crew uh, to earn money for my education. Uh, in fact, I received a union scholarship from my local to help pay for college. So personally, I strongly support the right of employees to decide whether or not to organize and join a union. Indeed, unions have been instrumental in bringing about the 40-hour work week, improved workplace safety standards, and the development of workers' compensation programs, policies that have made our nation much better. Uh, the University of Michigan, as we've heard, has a long and proud history of progressive labor relations and employment practices. Our earliest unions have been around for more than 50 years. The university remains neutral in what we say during labor organizing efforts, a principle that I fully support. We provide facts and data and do not take a position uh, in the effort consistent with what's proposed in today's resolution. Uh, likewise, I respect the collaborative approach to defining the community of interest as described in the resolution, along with its consideration of reasonableness and commitment to external arbitration when differences exist. My greatest concern about today's resolution has to do with the right of our faculty and staff to freely choose whether or not to be represented. The proposed policy requires that the university agree to a card check as the required way to assess faculty and staff interest in being represented by a union. There is no privacy involved with the card check. Organizers and often coworkers know exactly how each person voted or whether they chose to vote at all. Our democracy has thrived for centuries using the secret ballot. We've struggled as a nation and still do assuring that all our citizens have the right to exercise their franchise freely. It's the best way we've invented so far to assure freedom of choice in our democracy. So in sum, much of, much of what, what is proposed in the resolution codifies our current practices and certainly has my support. I urge the regions to be cautious, however, in creating policies that may make it harder to effectively administer the university or take away the freedom our faculty and staff currently enjoy to choose whether to organize. I value the mutual respect in our work and discussions and appreciate the region's deep commitment and devotion to our university. Uh, are there uh, further uh, questions or comments before I go ahead and call for the vote? Uh, yeah, Mr. Schomburg, uh, I appreciate your comments, President Sosal. I was, I was very informative actually. Um, I really view this as codifying sort of the, the best practices that the leadership team has been doing all along, right? So, so many of these things are just putting them in place so that irrespective of who is in leadership at the time, best practices are followed. Uh, I wanted to say I appreciate your team working with Regent Bernstein on the language. I think that the additions from your team on the language uh, improved it, and, and I, I'm, I'm glad that those were added. Um, the, uh, you know, we as a board vote in public. We don't vote by secret ballot. Um, and actually, that's been something different for me, right? Most of my votes are actually are actually done when you go into the voting booth. And so uh, it is it is different, but in a way, I think it centers you and you vote your, your values because it is public. And I think that um, the faculty, staff, students at our university are, are, are high level and vote their conscience um, and, and state, state their values easily. So um, I think that this practice that is um, really goes across the country has shown that it can, it's, it's very effective. And so I think that it will be an improvement, um, both codifying the best practices that your leadership team has already been doing and then um, sets us up uh, for a better future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Diggs. Uh, other comments before we vote? Okay, thank you very much. So we've had a motion and a second. We've had a robust discussion. And now I'll uh, call the roster once again, as I did earlier. Uh, Regent Acker? Aye. 
Regent Beam? Yes. Regent Bernstein? Yes. Regent Brown? Yes. Regent Diggs? Yes. Regent Illich? Yes. Regent Weiser? No. Regent White? Regent White? So forgive me, I'm, I'm guessing that Regent White had to uh, drop off the call. Uh, so I believe there were... I believe she left the call, yes. Thank you, Sally. Uh, so uh, I count uh, six yeses and one no. So Regent Bernstein's resolution carries. Uh, the amendment that was brought forward did not get a second, so it, it was not voted on. So uh, thank you all very much. And let's move uh, forward on our agenda. Uh, we now move on to the regular business agenda. Uh, the minutes and reports are on the website. Uh, other reports from the senior leadership team will begin with Chancellor Grasso. Thank you, uh, President Schlissel. Uh, I uh, want to again thank you for your investment in the Dearborn and Flint campuses. We look forward to working with you as we develop our plans to increase student success on our campus. Earlier this, uh, uh, this year, we announced, or, or this week, we announced our plans for fall, where we will have a hybrid public health informed semester with the majority of our courses being uh, taught remotely. We're, we're now working on de-densifying the on-campus components of, uh, of our instruction to make sure that everybody is uh, is going to be and remain healthy. Um, I, and I do want to just note one last thing that we're very proud of. U of M uh, Dearborn shared first place in the DTE and Energy Society of Detroit e-challenge. They submitted a 500 page report that documents how we can save $200,000 a year on our, our energy bills. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I next call upon Chancellor Dutta. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And I too would like to thank you once again for your investments on the regional campuses. To members of the Board of Regions, I'm very pleased that you will soon consider voting to approve Dr. Sonja Feast Price as the next Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at U of M Flint. She is the Vice President for Institutional Diversity and a Professor in the Department of Early Childhood Education in the College of Education at University of Kentucky. So we are very much looking forward to welcoming, uh, to welcoming a Kentucky Wildcat in the land of Wolverines. The blue remains the same, as you will remember. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Keith Moreland, who will complete his service as interim provost next week, June 30th. He didn't know, and neither did we, what he was signing up for when uh, he accepted the interim provost role. But I can say this with confidence that he served the campus exceedingly well during this very difficult time by having um, his guidance, I benefited significantly. So on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank Keith Moreland. Uh, a couple of other things, over a million people in the state of Michigan are a part of the non-completer population. So they have some credits, but no degrees. I'm very pleased to let you know that U of M Flint has received a $750,000 grant from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation to help these people complete their degrees. U of M Flint will match the dollars to make it a grant of 1.5 million. And what the plan is, it's called the pathway to completion and it will provide returning students um, of U of M Flint up to nine credits for free. So this will be an incentive for them to return and complete their degrees. So we are looking forward to it. And now I'd like to close with a comment on a U of M Flint student, Raymond Cush. He was our student speaker at the December 2019 graduation that Regent Brown attended. He might remember in Iraq, uh, Ray Kush uh, 
blew his left foot because of an IED attack. He suffered serious injuries throughout his body, including traumatic brain injury and later in PTSD. He's from Clio. He enrolled at Yogan Flint and he proved himself that not only was he an excellent student, he graduated with high honors. He was a Mason Blue, but he played hockey tremendously at an advanced level. And he qualified for the US World Cup hockey team, the disabled World Cup hockey team. So this month, he was named, Ray Kush was named 2020 USA Disabled Hockey Player of the Year. So in the issue of USA Hockey magazine, you will see a beaming Ray Kush. He could have picked any jersey. He had many. But here is what he picked. U of M Flint, Ray Kush. So thank you, Ray, for inspiring all of us. And thank you, Mr. President. Congratulations to Ray. Thanks uh, for sharing that story, Chancellor Dutta. It was really inspiring. Thank you very much. Uh, we President, now, uh, 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 President Schlissel, excuse me for interrupting. I just want to note um, for, uh, for the record that uh, Regent White is serving um, our country as a general in the mil military. Uh, and so we thank her for that. And that is uh, why she is absent. Thank you. Good. Thank you for mentioning. Forgive me for not mentioning that myself, but thank you very much, Denise. Um, we next move on to um, personnel reports. There are materials uh, in the book. Uh, the retirement memoirs are also in the book. Uh, so I now call for a vote on the consent agenda. Is there a motion on the consent agenda? So move. Thank you, Ron. Is there a second? Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. The consent agenda carries. We now move on to the re regular agenda, finance and property. Um, there's an item for information in the book, but I'll move on to the conflicts agenda. Items 2 through 17 are conflict of interest items, each of which requires six votes for approval. The regents have carefully reviewed all of these items and will consider them together as a block in one vote unless any region requests individual consideration of or recusal from voting on a particular item. Does anyone have any questions about a particular item? Would any regent like to request recusal from voting on any items? I now call for a vote on items two through 17. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. Or Regent Illich, is there a second? I hear Regent Bernstein a second. Uh, so uh, I will uh, now do a, a roll call just to make sure we get this right. Uh, Regent Acker? Aye. Regent Beam? Aye. Regent Bernstein? Aye. Regent Brown? Regent Brown? Aye. Thank you. Regent Diggs? Yes. Thank you. Regent Illich? Aye. Thank you very much. And finally, Regent Weiser? Yes. Aye. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we uh, now move on uh, to uh, other items. Uh, a building naming uh, uh, is as submitted in, in our materials. Is there a motion to approve? Support. Uh, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Thank you very much. Uh, I next move on to establishment of a university institute and ask Executive Vice President uh, and Dean of the Medical School, uh, Rungi, for some comments, and then we'll, we'll move forward with the motion. Thank Marshall. You, President, thank you, President Schlissel. Uh, I'm very pleased to share with you that Regent Ron Weiser and his family have generously provided a $30 million gift to establish the Elizabeth Weiser Caswell Diabetes Institute pending approval today. The institute will be named for Regent Weiser's daughter, Elizabeth, who has two sons and a husband with type one diabetes. Approximately 10% of Americans or 30 million 
have diabetes with twice that number suffering from prediabetes. This institute will focus on diabetes research and will bring to bear the university's broad research across many different schools and departments and colleges to develop life-saving diabetic therapies. We all are so appreciative of the Wiser family for their support and generosity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marshall. Yeah, I, I'd actually like to add my own comment as well to thank Ron. You know, Ron, in addition, of course, to being a regent, uh, is uh, one of the uh, main or major donors to the university. Uh, he supports things from athletics through every aspect of the academics of the university, and then, of course, our health system. Uh, diabetes as a disease, you heard the numbers from uh, Dr. Rungi. You know, a disease that affects 10% of the population and it's been growing. Uh, the debility created by that disease, the loss in quality of life and length of life is just profound. Uh, in terms of an important area and a fantastic moment to make such investments, I could, there couldn't be better. So, Ron, thank you very much for your uh, uh, generosity yet again and the wisdom of this choice in investing in such an important area of biomedical research. So thank you very much. Uh, can I uh, call for a motion? So moved. Uh, second. Court. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. The uh, motion carries, and uh, we now have a new institute. Uh, next is the UM Dearborn academic calendar. It's submitted in the book. Is there a motion? So moved. As, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Aye. That motion carries. And then finally, the Michigan Health Corporation business plan uh, as submitted in the book. Is there a motion to approve? So move. Support. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. The, the Michigan Health Corporation business plan passes. So we'll now move on uh, to uh, public comments, and I hand uh, the uh, gavel, the virtual gavel, over to uh, Secretary and Vice President Churchill. Okay, we will continue uh, with public comment on non-agenda related items. Um, our next speaker is uh, Delaner McCarmy. McCarney, sorry. Kelly, we don't have uh, that person. We've got Grace Carey up next. Okay, so that speaker is not on the line. I just want to confirm before I go on to the next speaker. That is correct. Okay, thank you. So then our next speaker is Grace Carey. Hi, um, hi I'm Grace Carey and I'm a Flint alum calling today to demand action that will create more equitable learning environments at the Flint and Dearborn campuses. I graduated a Mason Blue Scholar in 2014 with degrees in anthropology and sociology and I worked at UM Flint as a work study and full-time staff member. I am now a doctoral candidate in anthropology at Princeton University. Flint and Dearborn students are at a disadvantage to their Ann Arbor counterparts in a lack of inclusion, the lack of resources, and quite frankly, the lack of respect between the campuses. While I was a student and employee, the disparity caused by uneven funding distribution and resource allocation was tangible. Like many others at UM Flint, I didn't think grad school was possible. I thought I was marked by some Flint stigma that would prevent me from achieving such lofty ambitions. My faculty, however, went above and beyond to mentor me, filling the gaps in UM Flint's limited course offerings with syllabi and books loaned from their own bookshelves to prepare me for graduate school and by working tirelessly to make already stretched thin resources available to me. The fact that their time and labor was never institutionally recognized or supported to the fullest extent is unacceptable. Usually, anthropology undergraduate programs requ require independent research, something Ann Arbor students have the opportunity to do. However, Flint is not a research institution, and as such, there are no resources for undergrad research in anthropology. This set me years behind my Princeton colleagues, who all entered our program with research experience and methods training. My CV carried that hyphen Flint, even though it wasn't written on my diploma. It was written instead in the absence of internship opportunities and research experience. Opportunities in the form of workshops, lectures, internships, and research cannot be excluded from the Flint and Dearborn campuses. These resources would give us the same preparation our Ann Arbor peers already have for the job market and graduate school. It would offer opportunities to build networks and exposure to new ideas. The difference between those of us who attend a satellite campus in Ann Arbor 
lies not in our ability to excel, but in the tools we are given to excel with. You cannot expect us to compete with a broken spade when our peers at Ann Arbor have a construction crew at their disposal. The abundance of campus housing, meal plans, and financial support that are available at an institution like Princeton allows students the time, energy, and interest to flourish in the classroom. If given the opportunity, if given the resources, Flint and Dearborn students can also excel to this degree. When I learned that recent austerity measures will further limit the resources at Flint and Dearborn, even going so far as to abolish small courses, which have been proven in studies and at Princeton to increase student participation, I was outraged. I want to be proud to be a member of the world's largest and most prestigious alumni network, but I can't do that until all of us are afforded the same opportunities and resources to succeed. I want to be proud to be a part of an alumni network that is out changing the world for the better. So please, I urge you to help us make our backyard better first so that we are all equally prepared to face the world. Thank you. Sorry, Mike was off. Thank you, Grace. Our next speaker is Heather uh, Lobby. Hi, I'm Heather Lobby. I'm an associate professor of sociology on the Flint campus. Part of my job is to help students see how our social institutions are built on hierarchies of race, gender, social class, and heteronormativity. To make visible how the choices we often think we make freely are actually shaped by our position in these hierarchies. Yes, uh, sociology can get a little depressing. I don't wanna scare my students away, so I point out that people have created this society and that the written and unwritten rules by which we operate so we can change that society. I emphasize that if they want significant social change, they have got to change our institutions, including education, which they often see as the solution, not part of the problem. Right now, we're seeing demands for change in the streets, and we'll see another tactic at the polls in November. I know some of you are likely quite interested in the power of voters, and I know students look forward to exercising that power. We talk about institutions as if they are disembodied entities, but of course they're not. They're comprised of and constructed by people. You are quite literally the people constructing this institution. The choices you make right now, budget choices that necessitate canceling classes and laying off lecturers, refusing the Go Blue guarantee to Flint and Dearborn students, they harm our students, our campuses, and our communities. I know that you know nearly 64% of UM Flint students are women, about 12.5% are African American, 30% are over 25, and 38% are part-time, probably because of the ways those other categories intersect. 40% of our students are Pell eligible, and many are, are, of them are first-generation college students. They are, to my mind, extraordinary in their commitment to their education, their families, and their communities. They are extraordinary in spite of your lack of support, not because of the University of Michigan's commitment to them. In this particular moment, when hierarchies of race and gender and social class are highly visible, my students will more easily see how the University of Michigan embodies and perpetuates these inequalities. This is personal for them. They will want to know what they can do to change it. They will want to know what you are doing to change it. Thank you for the shared funds for Flint and Dearborn, but I hope you will give me an example to use in my classes this fall of how people, elected officials and leaders of a prestigious institution of higher education, can make institutional change that helps rather than harm. I urge you to fund the Go Blue Guarantee at the July meeting. Take a stand on the side of our students. Take a stand against systemic racism, against institutionalized gender inequality, against structural economic inequality. Make this institution one that resists these things. Show us you value our students and that public higher education is not reserved only for the privilege. I anticipate that students will demand this and I will be happy to support them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Heather. Our next speaker is Omar Elmore. Omar? 
Uh, Sally, can I interject? Heather, would you mind sending us a copy of your comments, please? Thank you. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Okay, I think we may have Omar on the line now. He's unmuted, Sally, but he's not speaking. Omar, here's your moment. <laughs> Omar, we can't hear you if you're speaking. Kara, he's unmuted and his mic is working and he did a sound check earlier. That's correct. Can you guys hear me? Now we can hear you. We couldn't hear you before. So if you can speak now, that'd be great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Omar. Um, speaking as a member of student government, uh, director of diversity, equity, and inclusion at U of M Flint. I speak today only to provide my experience as a student at this campus. So four years ago, coming into this university as a Muslim, I was greeted with a network of other Muslim friends that I'd previously known from my community. I used these connections to get advice on how to get through orientation, what classes or professors to take, how to to pursue my career choice, which advises to go to even um, upcoming assignments and exam reminders. So they were my support system and the pathway to college success. Um, and that was clear thanks to lifelong friends. But as time went on, more and more of these uh, friends graduated or transferred to schools. And I was left alone with the understanding that I would not have advanced so swiftly uh, without the privilege of support from my community. But what is there to say about students who don't have these advantages? Virtually alone to figure out everything for themselves, forced into trial and error while they're on the clock for graduation. That is the state of most of the students on this campus. So the Board of Regents has the ability uh, to offer these same resources to other students by investing in DEI initiatives. The very resources that, I, uh, that other students lack is a community which I felt a sense of belonging to. And U of M Flint needs to have the capacity to support these students by allowing them programs in which they can identify with others, mentor and assist one another, and thereby be supported. Um, and lastly, I wanted to comment on the overall state of campus life. Um, over a four year span, um, my personal experience is that I've seen less and less life on campus, the morale visibly being depleted, and uh, little support done to our uh, clubs of diverse identity. Uh, in national tragedies, you know, more often than not, uh, it's a threat to students of diverse identities, like what we've had recently with the George Floyd incident and many more that we can't even count right now. We get a supportive email from the administration, but uh, little else is done about it except uh, what our clubs of diverse identities do for it. And it's usually our clubs that hold the supportive dialogues or vigils. It's the clubs that extend a hand to the students for uh, giving them a sense of belonging on campus. And so the data and research highlighted in the one university proposal demands the Flint and Dearborn campuses be provided with funding necessary to support students in success. It is critical the board immediately reverse the damages and layoffs made on Flint campus. Earlier this week, UM spokesperson Rick Fitzgerald cited enrollment decline in our campus as justification for the significant layoffs. To me, that's not a solution, and it only per perpetuates the situation that we're dealing with here at Flint. Our student government has created this position that I'm in right now as a step forward, but there's little more that we can do without the necessary funding. So as a student of UM Flint, if the Board of Regents continue to delay the funding requests, I'm afraid the sustainability of my campus will continue to be turned. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Bennett Walling. Hi, uh, my name is Bennett Walling and I'm uh, an Ann Arbor student who's transferred from U of M Flint for this upcoming fall semester. Um, in this time when the national zeitgeist is focused on dismantling systemic racism, it is important to remember that it is not just the criminal justice system that supports white supremacy. 
it is also the education system. It is one thing for the university to declare that Black Lives Matter as we open this meeting, and another thing to show that Black lives actually matter by funding where Black and Brown students attend at greater rates, in this case, being U of M Flint and U of M Dearborn. On this topic, the Brookings Institute just released a report about regional public universities, which U of M Flint and U of M Dearborn are, which broadly finds that austerity is not the answer as we continue to push through the COVID-19 crisis. It was just on Monday that U of M Flint hosted a webinar to, dis to discuss this report. Chancellor Dutta gave the opening remarks. During that webinar, Dennis Olson, the commissioner of Minnesota's Office of Higher Education, explained that, and I quote, now is not the time to even entertain the idea of budget cuts or disinvestments in our RPUs. This struck me as deeply ironic as the university is divesting in Flint and Dearborn. It is cutting department budgets. It is laying off lectures and it is enforcing a regime of austerity. This is not what the University of Michigan should stand for. Our students need you all to be there for them in actions and not just in empty words. Mr. Bernstein, earlier this meeting and last year, you said that you need to be all in for Flint and Dearborn, but the actions have thus far been the opposite of that. Now is the time to stay true to your words and actually go all in for our communities by extending the Go Blue Guarantee, by providing the much needed health and legal services to our campuses by reversing recent austerity measures and by supporting the GEO group rather than in con uh, continuing to abandon us in our time of need. And the shared fund discussed earlier in this meeting is a really good start to providing equity to the Flint and Dearborn campuses, but it is just a start. We demand additional investment in the forms that I just listed, but specifically the extension of the Go Blue Guarantee. Furthermore, I appreciate the force of will of agents Acker, Diggs, Brown, and Illich to vote no on a budget that does not go far enough to support the Flint and Dearborn campuses. I hope the board will consider these additional investments when they're discussing the upcoming July budget. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hussan uh, Javier. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. My name is Hassan Jaber, and I'm the president of and CEO of Access, the largest Arab American uh, organization in the nation. Access is, has been serving our community for the past 49 years, providing 120 programs through regional and national institutions, including the Arab American National Museum. I did share in advance a written testimony for the record, but allow me to briefly highlight a couple of points. This pandemic crisis um, adds urgency, among other things, to better define the relationship between University of Michigan and Arbor and the Dearborn and Flint campuses. I'm asking the regions and the administration not to abandon Dearborn and Flint in this time of COVID crisis. Do not allow classes and faculty and staff to be cut, which will further negatively impact student success. Information that it may be necessarily to use $1 billion of University of Michigan endowment to offset the Ann Arbor losses. In comparison, investing 20 to 30 million in Dearborn and Flint to reverse cuts in classes, faculty, and staff, and to enact the one new recommendations is an extremely small amount to take from the endowment in this time of crisis. This investment is an opportunity to grow Dearborn and Flint and to ensure long-term financial st stability for the two campuses and frankly to live up to the reputation of leaders and best. 
I think it's it's important for Michigan residents and voters to remind everyone that while only 50% of University and our, of University of Michigan and Arbor students are from Michigan families, in comparison to over 90% of Dearborn and Flint students are from Michigan families. Even with the good blue guarantee, only about 15% of University of Michigan and Arbor and undergraduates come from households earning less than 60,000. By contrast, about 40% of University of of Michigan Flint and University of Michigan Dearborn students come from the bottom half, half of the income distribution. Our economic values that we do more to help more financially challenged in our community. Finally, I applaud the board uh, for your vote on union recognition policy. Thank you for your consideration and, and thank you for the work you do. Thank you, Hussan. Our next speaker is Richard Rood. Thank you for the opportunity to make a statement. My name is Richard Rood, and I am a professor in the Department of Climate and Space Sciences and Engineering. I've been teaching climate change courses at the University of Michigan since 2006. I started my first course on climate change at the request of three students in policy and business the focus of this course was on the intersections between climate change and all aspects of society. This led to a curriculum on climate change problem solving. In 2008, it was obvious that we collectively were not going to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions enough to avoid a dangerous global warming. Indeed, we were then one degree warmer than the pre-industrial world and already experiencing dangerous climate change. I changed my courses to think about a world four degrees warmer. There is no evidence-based knowledge that we, globally, are on a path to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. There is no evidence-based logic to support that we will develop, in the next decade, federal or global policy that will reduce carbon dioxide emissions. In order to manage global warming, we will have to develop technology to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This does not mean that we are relieved of our responsibility to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Solutions will need to come from individuals and organizations. Now, in my courses, I talk about necessary losses. Preservation will have to change. Conservation will have to change. Legacy will have to change. We are not going back. In 2009, I gave a Michigan seminar in Florida because it might offend donors, there was apprehension about having a climate change presentation at this event. Since then, I have received climate denying manuscripts written by donors for me to review. I have heard the arguments and the risk assessments by those at the university to construct the barriers that slow our addressing climate change. The University of Michigan is an organization that is immersed in knowledge. I'm encouraged by the recent decisions of the university and the regents to address the challenges of carbon neutrality. As I encourage my students to influence their organizations, I encourage the university to use its knowledge base to be proactive about its role and to become a leader to influence other organizations and our civilizations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, next up is Hallie Fox. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Um, hello, President Schlissel and the University of Michigan Regents Board. My name is Hallie Fox, and along with being a class of 2020 university alum, I'm a member of the Washtenaw County Environmental Council and a staff member at the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. MLCV is a nonpartisan organization working at the federal, state, and local levels for a more sustainable future that protects people and the public health, and I am here representing them today. Because of my various backgrounds as an activist, representative, and policy analyst, I come to you with experience at the federal, state, and local levels, and with a few requests for continuing the fight for environmental leadership here at our university. 
This is a troubling time in our nation's history. Both the COVID-19 pandemic and the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, and so many others have brought systemic injustices to the forefront of our nation's consciousness. As an institution who's committed itself to diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think the university would fall short of its goals in protecting these values if it did not continue to fight for climate action, as research from this very institution has shown that climate change and pollution disproportionately affect people of color. Although the university has taken action on climate change mitigation and adaptation, as a regional, national, and global thought leader, we have a responsibility to continue to push for carbon neutrality in leading by principle and through example. We need to think more broadly about how the university can achieve carbon neutrality within its own systems and operations. Consistent with the PCCN's interim report, we need to take action by updating all of our buildings to passive heating and cooling systems and increasing the number of solar installations on campus. We also need to realize that the University of Michigan does not exist in a vacuum, and we must assist other entities in implementing their climate goals. Specifically, the City of Ann Arbor and Washtenaw County have identified cooperation with the University of Michigan as necessary in order to achieve carbon neutrality. I would love to see the University publicly commit to helping the City of Ann Arbor reach its most ambitious sustainability goals. We are far past the moment for individual do-gooder action. We need systemic change at every level of government and from every leading institution in order to create a sustainable future. And although legislatures and policymakers can pass bills and set goals that seek to reach carbon neutrality before 2030, respected institutions like the University of Michigan are responsible for charting the path forward, shaping culture, and emboldening decision makers. I am proud to be a Wolverine. James Earl Jones doesn't lie every football Saturday when he says that we are the greatest university in the world. I have seen Wolverines lead and rise to face every challenge set in front of them. President Slissel, Regents, even in this COVID-19 crisis, I do not hesitate to say that climate change is the biggest challenge that I will face in my lifetime. I hope that you will join me in taking it head on. Thank you and go blue. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Dr. Aaron Agrawal. Mr. Chairman, President, Dr. Schlissel, Regents. My name is Arun Agarwal. I'm a faculty member in the School for Environment and Sustainability. I'm a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. Thank you for the opportunity to provide a public comment about your action on climate. Thinking about climate action right after the Regents did not approve the budget for next year seems anticlimactic. Doing so in a context overwhelmed by COVID-19 seems a waste of time. The effects of the pandemic have expanded to fill our imagination, the influence our thinking and action in ways unimaginable six months ago, as your vote on the budget demonstrates. But three years from now, perhaps even just two years from now, the pandemic will have passed. Many people will still be concerned about it, but there's something that happened learn its effects in retrospect, and to prevent something similar perhaps from happening again. We know another pandemic at the scale of COVID-19, and perhaps even more deadly, will come. But in this last effort to prevent a similar, perhaps more deadly pandemic from happening again, we will fail. We will fail because as humans, we do not appreciate, let alone act on even civilization scale threats that are distant, uncertain, and whose effects we cannot accurately estimate. We fail to act on such threats even with adjacent experience. In all three respects, remoteness, uncertainty, and lack of precision, climate change is like that distant pandemic that has not yet filled our imagination. But future climate change impacts are as certain as there is a sun and a moon. They will be more ubiquitous, more impactful, more deadly, and much, much, much more longer lasting than anything we have seen for the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of these will come in our lifetimes, certainly in the lifetimes of our students. The question is, how do we act? Two actions come to mind. They seem small, but have the potential for force changing leadership and impact by the University of Michigan. I mentioned the first because the university can act to reduce costs at the same time as it acts to reduce emissions for climate action. 
important problems, especially so now. To do so, we should distinguish between net zero emissions by the university reducing total emissions attributable to it and UM's gross zero local emissions. UM can achieve net zero emissions at little to no cost through acquiring utility scale solar in places most advantageous for solar energy and retirement of acquired carbon credits. Additional benefits are reputational. One might say the reputational benefits of zero local emissions are so important that we should focus on costly engineering solutions at the university to reduce our direct emissions locally. Local emissions, it's reducing local emissions is a worthy goal, but achieving net zero emissions allows us to achieve a worthy climate goal immediately. The second obvious action we can undertake on climate is that related to full divestment from fossil fuel investments in the university's endowment. There are many reasons such divestment is forward thinking. The University of Michigan does not exist to serve its endowment. The future of energy is renewable. We should act as soon as possible for the reputation benefits of divestment as well. Many universities have already done so, and we can't say we must only act on economic grounds and we do not do so for net zero emissions. We clearly care about reputation. Thank you for listening. Go blue. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jennifer Tiplett? Tri I'm sorry, Triplett, excuse me. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Triplett, a graduate student at UM Ann Arbor. Uh, I want to begin today by thanking the Regents for passing the board resolution in favor of employer neutrality, majority recognition, and expedited bargaining unit determination, and that will lead to recognition for UPA and M. Thank you. The main reason I'm here today, however, is to speak about how the university's response to the COVID pandemic has failed graduate student workers. The university has failed us in our capacity as students and researchers by not acknowledging how the pandemic related shutdowns have negatively affected our ability to carry out critical research and knowledge production. The expectation that graduate students continue to meet program milestones and carry on with business as usual is unrealistic considering the disruption in our work. When university graduate workers requested deadline and funding extensions to make up for these disruptions, which universities like Yale and Harvard have granted to their students, the university ignored us. The university has also filled graduate student workers in our capacity as parents. Graduate workers who are parents face a doubly heavy load given that they have had to care for their children at home um, due to child care facility closures. Graduate workers ask the university for flexibility in shifting the child care subsidy from licensed child care facilities to non-licensed alternatives to allow them to return to critical work, yet the university has not done so unlike peer institutions such as Berkeley, Stanford, and Princeton that do allow this flexibility. The funds already exist, and a simple rule change will allow parents to actually make use of them. Finally, the university has failed graduate student workers through the disbursement of emergency funding. I'll share now the story of Oke Savas, an international graduate student at UM Ann Arbor. Oke became homeless during the pandemic, and the university did nothing to help. When her living situation turned dangerous due to a violent upstairs neighbor, Oke applied for emergency funding from Rackham and was denied. After that, she was forced to stay on friends' couches, moving from house to house during a pandemic and while in the final stages of completing her dissertation. Oke's situation demonstrates the need for universal emergency funding for all graduate students. To conclude, graduate workers who make up a large part of the university's teaching power deserve a living wage, extended deadlines and funding, and a seat at the table and deciding our fall working conditions. Instead, we are looking at overwork as we transition to in-person and online classes, disrupted research and inflexible deadlines, and a unilateral announcement about our fall working conditions that has had no graduate worker input. I implore the university to remember its promise to put people first, listen to graduate workers struggling under pandemic conditions, protect people, not the endowment. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Next up is Gail Adams. Go ahead, Gail. Good afternoon. My name is Gail Adams. I have been a PA in urology for the past five years and intermittently with Michigan Medicine for 15 years. I am speaking on behalf of United Physician Assistants of Michigan Medicine, UPAM. 
I am extremely excited to address the board today. We are very happy to hear that you adopted a policy that will uh, regarding neutrality, regarding organizing, and we hope that this will quickly lead to recognizing UPAM as an official union. For almost two years, our organizing committee, along with the support of our partners, the American Federation of Teachers, have been working to meet with PAs across the institution. What I personally have learned is that our members of, our, of UPAM are unique and special, but we all share a passion to provide quality care to our patients. And I should clarify, not just the members who have joined UPAM or have indicated interest, but even my colleagues, my PA colleagues, who are not interested in joining a union. We share a passion for our profession and for providing quality care to patients. As a matter of fact, all the PAs in my department were the first in line to volunteer during uh, for redeployment, um, including colleagues of mine and friends of mine who are not interested in UPAM. One of the main reasons we began this effort was to gain parity with our unionized colleagues. The university recently helped make this even clearer with the difference between having a union contract and not having a contract when it announced drastic cuts to our compensation. PAs recognize sacrifices may be required, but we also believe strongly that any sacrifices should be borne in a fair and equal fashion and through negotiations with the affected employees. Through the years, we have seen benefits like retirement and PTO change at the whim of the administration without any input from us. We truly do appreciate previous statements of support from the Board of Regents because that really has inspired us to continue with our efforts. With today's recognition of neutrality in forming unions, we hope that this is the first step in the right direction and look forward to working with you, the Board of Regents, and the hospital administration to quickly move into negotiations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Regent Brown wanted to make a comment. Regent Brown? Yes, I'd like to thank the last speaker for her words, uh, but especially her and her colleagues for all of the work they're, they're doing during this pandemic, uh, like I mentioned earlier in, in the meeting. Um, pending verification of uh, the majority of the members of support uh, for the bargaining unit, I'm really honored and excited uh, to recognize you, Pam, as the representatives of the PAs, um, hopefully the first thing next week. Uh, I know this will make U of M and Michigan Medicine an even better place to work and an even better caregiver to our patients. And I just want to say again, congratulations on the success uh, to all and all of your hard work to you and all of your colleagues. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Natalie uh, Wassinger Pep. Or Pape, sorry. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. I'm a PhD student at, in physiology at the U, at U of M in Ann Arbor. First, thank you for supporting the policy of employer neutrality. However, I am here today to demand that the university prioritize the health and safety of its graduate workers by supporting GEO's requests in their recent open letter. Graduate workers consist of particularly vulnerable populations, including black and indigenous and other students of color, working class students, students with disabilities, first generation students, international students, and students with children, all of whom are disproportionately affected by the global pandemic. The university's decision to host in-person classes in the fall creates a health risk to these graduate workers and the broader community. My colleagues are already putting themselves at risk by continuing laboratory research, and the addition of teaching in the fall increases their risk of exposure and increases the risk of unknowingly spreading the virus to others. Given the health risk of in-person teaching, 
Graduate workers must be consulted in drawing up fall teaching plans and must be given the option to teach remotely. Administration has ignored the requests by graduate workers to be involved in shaping our working conditions during this global pandemic. Specific concerns voiced by vulnerable groups of graduate students have also been ignored. Given the pandemic, most childcare facilities have been closed, requiring in-home care for graduate students with children. We request that U of M's child care subsidy be available for unlicensed child care and expanded for caregiving beyond child care. International students may not know when they will be able to return to their home countries, whether they will be able to re-enter the United States if they do, and how the pandemic may affect their visas. Many were ineligible for the federal stimulus payment and funding from students' home countries may be at risk. We demand the university first allows the option for international graduate students to teach remotely. Secondly, provide resources to address visa issues. And lastly, end its $500 per semester international student fee, which is a blatant contradiction to the university's DEI principles. And to further create a safe campus for all, we call for U of M to actively support the disarmament and defunding of campus police. Police violence disproportionately affects members of UM's Black community and other people of color on campus. The $12 million spent on campus police could be used elsewhere. The university could invest that money in the Flint campus, as called for by the One University campaign, or use the funds to extend a $2,500 emergency grant to all graduate workers. Thank you. Um, I have a... a question, I don't know if it's marked to you or to the speaker, if I heard you right, um, I, I had thought that under the, our plan, it was going to be discretionary if, if uh, people want, were going to teach remotely or physically. Am I, is that right or no? Uh, Provost Collins, will you uh, step in and explain the current situation and the work we're doing? Uh, yes, so we are in the process of devising a, um, a way forward that balances the preferences and um, of our uh, graduate students as well as faculty uh, with our uh, plans to have a hybrid semester, and, uh, and those will be forthcoming. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm going to our last speaker of the day, uh, and that is uh, Aaron, um, Aaron Miller. Thank you for taking my time, uh, taking your time, uh, Vice President Churchill. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, of course, a dubious honor of being between you and lunch. So I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Aaron Miller. I'm the president and founder of Quantum Opus, a uh, small high-tech quantum technology company founded in 2013. I'm here on behalf of our business and 11 other small businesses that have really thrived through long-term partnership with the University of Michigan, but that are now being threatened by the termination of access to essential manufacturing tools owned by the university. The Lurie Nanofabrication Facility, or LNF, on Anamars, Ann Arbor's North Campus is a world-class semiconductor research and small manufacturing resource. Quantum Opus and many other small local businesses were founded locally specifically because of the ability to lease the clean room and its unique tools to do our product development and production. The world-class products made at LNF serve customers in quantum computing, information technology, aerospace and defense, as well as hospitals and medical research institutions around the world. Now, in the same way that a new Michigan graduate, um, as they work off to pay student loans, might lease an apartment because they can't yet afford a house, as small local companies, we can't afford to buy the world-class tools at the LNF. But in partnership with the University of Michigan, we've benefited greatly by renting the tools and the clean space to make essential products and build the Michigan economy. As manufacturers, we were pleased that Governor Whitmer restarted manufacturing with appropriate new safety measures. However, however because the university has not recognized us as manufacturers and instead has classified us as visitors, our manufacturing is stalled. Beyond being manufacturers, we are extremely low risk manufacturers. If you look through the yellow tinted windows on Beale Street, you'll note that anyone working in the LNF in the clean room there wears higher levels of PPE than are required at hospitals. We wear head to toe clean suits, double layers of gloves, face masks, head coverings, and safety glasses 
The facility is continuously HEPA filtered with high airflow and positive pressure. The clean room is cleaned and alcohol sanitized daily. The LNF is the cleanest work environment in the state of Michigan. The University of Michigan mission states that the university is to serve the people of Michigan and the world through preeminence in creating, communicating, preserving, and applying knowledge. We're asking for your service now. Without your decision to reopen the LNF to external users, the livelihood of Michigan workers will be lost. Growing semiconductor businesses will be forced to close their doors or leave the state. And a core competitiveness of the University of Michigan, the LNF, will be diminished. So on behalf of NeuroNexus, Hawk Semiconductor, UD Holdings, Versana Micro, NewMed Technologies, SoundScript, BMB Solutions, Transloom, B. Lilly Technologies, Integrated Sensing Solutions, and Quantum Opus LLC, with the support of the LNF Managing Director and the LNF Faculty Director, I make the following appeal. Please open the Learning Nanofabrication Facility to at external users. It advances essential technologies, protects local high-tech jobs, grows the Michigan semiconductor industry, and future jobs for Michigan graduates. It obeys both the letter and the spirit of the governor's executive orders, and it fulfills the Michigan mission of the University of Michigan. Above all, however, it is safe. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much. I believe Regent Brown wanted to make a comment before we wrap up. Uh, no, that was an old message. I already made my comments. So uh, never mind. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to, on behalf of the board and the executive team, thank all of the speakers uh, for their uh, thoughtful comments, uh, every one of which on an issue that we're working on. So thank you very much for that input. Uh, I wish everybody uh, good health and uh, the board adjourns until its July meeting. Thank you all very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.